calling this meeting back to order of the Sacramento City Unified School District Board of Education. Welcome back. All right, um, item 4.0, um, Pledge of Allegiance will be led by our superintendent. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. All right, good to ever see broadcast statement. This meeting of the Sacramento City School Board is being recorded in its entirety and will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T Uverse. Today's meeting will air Monday, May 24th at noon, and Wednesday, May 26th at noon. It will, it's also webcast at metro14live.saccounty.net and can be viewed on Metro Cable 14's YouTube channel. The public has been given the opportunity to address the board through public comment, either by submitting comments which are posted on our website or by speaking during the meeting. Members of the public who wish to speak submitted a speaker form by noon today and were sent a link to participate. When it is your turn to provide comment, we will call on you to do so orally. Your video will not be on. Please always limit comments during public comment two items that are not on the agenda. If you do comment on an item that is, we will ask that you please defer your comments until your item comes up. Fantastic, thank you, student member Shay. Uh, item 4.3, stellar student. Um, tonight, I actually have the pleasure of honoring our stellar student. Um, I And I apologize if I say her. Are we skipping the closed session announcements? Two points. Oh, that is my fault. And now, no, 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 no okay, we haven't sorry. got there yet. Yeah, yeah, no, we're not there. Okay, it is my honor to be able to present uh, Hina Stenkizai. Um, she's a seventh grade um, student from Albert Einstein Middle School. The student was selected by her teacher, Julie Del Agua, who said, I would love to nominate my student, Hina Stenkizai. She is an EL student who has improved amazingly over this year. She is always in class and Zoom and Slash, or I should say slash Zoom, um, always tries her hardest, does all of her work, and does it with a positive and upbeat attitude. Although she has a lot going on at home with her younger siblings, she does an amazing job. She participates in class and has her camera on. Yay! <laughs> As Ms. Delagua put it. Overall, she is an amazing student at Albert Einstein. Do we have Hina online? Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. Would you like to say a few words? Congratulations. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words about your school and your experience that you've had this year? Uh, yeah, like uh, this year, like um, the teacher helped me a lot, and like when in technology class in the other classroom, like teacher like helping me and they support me my parents support me a lot and like when they support me i'm getting better in my study fantastic well thank you so much for being such a great student and uh, i hope to be able to see you in the classroom soon you take care congratulations thank you we'll send you out a certificate all right okay congratulations <laughs> Thank Can I you. just say one thing really quickly? Sure. Nina, we just want to say from all of your teachers, we are so, so proud of you. You started the year very shy and timid, and you have just blossomed into an amazing student, and you have improved so much, and we are just so proud of you. Very Thank sweet. You. Thank you, Ms. Delagua. We appreciate it. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right, item 5.0, announcement of action taken in closed session. Good evening, President Pritchett. There are two announcements coming out of closed session this evening. First, the board approved a special education settlement agreement identified as OAH case number 20201-20235 by a unanimous vote of seven to zero. The second announcement will come from the superintendent. 
Thank you, Ms. Collins. I'm uh, very pleased to announce that the board, by a unanimous vote of seven to zero, approved the appointment of Ms. Leticia Busio as principal of the Arthur A. Benjamin Health Professions High School. Congratulations, Ms. Busio. Congratulations. All right, item 6.0, agenda adoption. Can I get a motion to approve? Yes. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. All right, item 7.0, public comment. We have 10 live public comments, um, which I'll allow for two minutes for each public comment on this agenda topic. Uh, the first public comment will be Ingrid Hutchins. Good evening. My name is Ingrid Hutchins and I'm a second grade teacher at Golden Empire. Although our district has had an image problem for as long as I can remember, our issues have grown exponentially in the recent years. We're not only suffering from the common woes most districts are currently battling, but we're also dealing with what can only be described as a toxic relationship. Over the past few years, our community, especially its labor partners, have been pitted against one another. No one has questioned why this was being done. Everyone just took a side and argued. For a while, a common villain was highlighted, SCTA. Regardless of what the issue was, the, the blame tend to go towards SCTA. A certain opinion writer for the B not only continued to, to attack SCTA in print, but he also texted a board member threatening to give board members bad publicity if they cracked. Parents started saying things like, I love our teachers, but I can't stand SCTA. Regardless of the numerous times PERBs ruled in favor of SCTA, none of you considered that maybe there was a reason why judges were finding fault with the district's labor practices. More recently, other labor partners have received this, some of the same treatment. SEIU was dragged to the mud for insisting on safe working conditions. UPE members have been accused of going rogue when in fact they were just following direct orders. Why on earth would any organization that wants to successfully serve its community try to create this type of environment for its employees? How does this type of environment benefit the students we claim to put first? If your employees leave the district, who will be doing the work of educating students, feeding them, keeping them safe, transporting them, keeping their learning spaces clean and germ-free? This insanity needs to end. As the governing group tasked with providing oversight of the district, you have the power to change the death spiral of SCUSD. It all begins with you, how you speak about the district's labor partners, how you listen to their concerns, how you interact with the community, both in person and in online groups, the messages you give to the media, the resolutions you write. If you want to turn this around, work with us. Treat us as the professionals that we are. Ask us how hey, things Ms. can Hutchins, be better. Wrap it up. I, I certainly will. When we don't agree with something you want, ask us why and listen with the intent to understand rather than to just write a rebuttal. It's up to you as a board to fix the mess and not sling the mud. Every situation hits a tipping point. We're at ours. You have the power to change things and to turn our district into a world-class organization or to let it fester. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Alan Hawk. Hello. I wish to make a comment uh, regarding the benefit of returning to a dedicated or a non concurrent teaching model, uh, particularly for grades one through three. Uh, first, this is how I define uh, the word dedicated. It means having single-minded devotion to a task or purpose with loyalty and integrity. I want to highlight the word, the word single-minded because every day uh, this year, teachers across our district have had that dedication for our students. I am particularly proud to work with such devoted colleagues at Golden Empire, uh, where I've worked for the past uh, 17 years. However, despite our fervent dedication, we are hindered by the demands inherent in a concurrent model that doesn't align with our students uh, in many ways developmentally and emotionally. In first grade, where I teach, where choral reading, learning, and responses are, are essential, these have had to be dramatically scaled back because of audio feedback problems that hurt their ears. Also notice 
Uh, many students at home don't have the same support available to them compared to earlier this year because many parents are now having to go back to work. Young children need to be uh, in the physical proximity, in the presence of a caring, devoted adult, whether it's a teacher or a family member. And it is not something we can just assume all kids have in their homes. Our neighboring districts have managed to preserve this vital principle of dedicated instruction as it is traditionally understood in their school plans for next year. Elk Grove, for example, is dropping their concurrent learning and planning for both five-day in-person instruction and a virtual academy for their families. I believe SCUSD students and families have the same needs as families in neighboring districts. I would love to see SCUSD work together with its labor partners to develop plans for next year that are similar to other districts, particularly for grades one through three, while maintaining mask wearing and social distancing per our California public health codes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Lena Cervantes. Alina, are you online? Okay. Jody Bone. Terrence Gladney. Good evening. Um, I want to take a moment. Um, I, I currently serve on the uh, the facilities master planning um, committee or, or group. Um, I want to take a moment to publicly uh, thank um, all of the staff that are involved with that work. Uh, you know, including uh, Rose Ramos, Nathaniel Browning, Amna Javed, Vincent Harris, and Crystal Hoff, among others. Um, over the course of probably the first few meetings, um, it felt sort of, you know, to, to quote student board member Shake, it felt car, par for the course for Sac City, and meaning that as an involved parent and, and servant leader and advocate, um, we seem to be talking in circles where equity kept came, coming up. Uh, we, we disputed the data and, and research that was proposed, you know, so supposedly supporting the equity around facilities. Um, but, but something happened over the past month during the time that we we're focused on returning to school uh that group and the leadership with the consultant they actually paused they took a step back and redirected and pivoted us in a new direction where they said we don't know we're not experts in equity so we will bring in outside support um and in our last meeting which was a couple weeks or so ago um, we actually had a listening session where we actually felt heard. We felt our voices were relevant. Um, we felt like we were doing a, a deeper dive that was more uh, respectful and 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 you know considerate of our time. Um, I, I saw a, a, I saw a social media post where someone said, you know, if if you have to have an appreciation day for a profession, you know, it means that you know it, it means that that obviously that that profession is underappreciated. It, it should not be necessary for me to publicly thank staff for being transparent and listening and considering the voices of we the stakeholders of this district that should be the norm so i ask that you guys as the leadership of our district you know actually oversee some of these processes to make sure that not only are our voices heard but actions are implemented to support them and implement it all the way down to the school site thank you thank you mr gladney next comment julie del agua Hello, thank you. This is Julie Delagua. Sorry, I just took a bite. And um, I am a teacher in the district. And I just want to reiterate, I know I said this the last board meeting, but with us doing um, distance learning and hybrid learning, and in my case, two thirds of my students are at home learning, having um, consistent and dependable internet is huge and key. And currently right now, some sites don't have that. Plus we have our filtering issue. Um, and I just really urge um, to get this fixed sooner than later so that we as teachers can actually uh, do our job. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delegua. Rich Vasquez. Good 
Good evening, uh, Superintendent and uh, members of the board. Again, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I wanted to talk about, I know there's still uh, millions of dollars of COVID funding on the table, and I haven't heard where that's going. Uh, and I know that the LCAP is presenting tonight, and we're supposed that's what the LCAP uh, helps the most needed help students. So I still want to talk about the side I attend. Uh, I, the side I attend, we have the highest number of students with disabilities. Uh, which is 17 percent. We have 30 uh, percent English learners. That's the highest percent in the district. 20 percent of those are long-term English learners. We have high chronic absenteeism yearly. Our attendance rate has been falling steadily this year. We're at around 82 percent uh, for the year this year during distance learning, the worst in the district. 85 percent socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, most of our dashboard is red. We have high teacher vacancies, almost 20 in the last five years, highest. I mean, I know we're working on that, but it's still still the facts. Uh, my school is mentioned in the uh, capital suspensions report. The feeder school is mentioned in the uh, capital suspensions report. What type of work are we doing with that? What are we doing at the district level? Uh, over at the site, we get all these students, whatever they live to your sites previously, we're trying to fix that, right? We get a lot of students that are already behind and now it looks like our school site's bad but we're doing the work um you know again what are we going to do about it um uh this we had a school improvement grant recently this we right here in year four and five we've been in distance learning how much have we could have implemented that correctly you know when we have a school improvement grant we need to be in person um yeah, I know. Do do our students even know how to read? I know my child. She recently got some help over at at the at the school site, the student support center, and now she's you want now that she knows that she has something and that she needs help with that. And we got the I, IEP and the 504 and whatnot. Now she feels more confident, right? Do our students know? Maybe they need to know that hey, there is something wrong, right? That's what we just found out with my child. So again, a lot of these things these kids might not know, these families might not know. We need them to know that, and then that could build their confidence, right? Thank you. Uh, again, we need to be back on campus so we can really start getting our kids back together. Thank you. Thank you. Angie Sutherland. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, greetings, uh, Superintendent Aguilar, Board President Pritchett, and members of the board and all those tuning in. I'm speaking uh, as a parent on this item, but I'm also a co-organizer of the Coalition for Students with Disability. Um, I wanted to talk about um, issues with the special education local plan process. CAC members have not been provided with an opportunity to weigh in on the development of the special education local plan. The plan is due on June 1st and um, I'm sorry, July 1st, and it's already almost June. And um, we're, all suppo we're also supposed to be giving input on the annual budget plan at the same time. Um, so this is just a reminder to the board of the requirements for the local planning process, and we hope um, that you become well versed in this. Uh, it has to be developed and updated cooperatively by a committee of representatives of special education and general education teachers and administrators selected by the groups they represent and with participation of parent members from the community advisory committee. Um, it, it's supposed to include also, this is all in ed code, a, a schedule of regular consultations regarding policy and budget development with the CAC. It was disappointing in the last few CAC meetings that there have been no discussions. Um, there have been presentations, but there haven't been um, where members can actually like weigh in on the development of the plan. And this is the CAC's primary area of advisement. Of, of advisement. So um, that's where the focus should be right now. Um, the district lacks the voices of CAC members on these important plans and needs to improve their efforts to engage parents and be transparent. Um, Thank also, you, Ellen, please wrap it up. Okay, also there hasn't been any announcement of the committee that's supposed to be formed um, even though there have been asks on this several times. Thank you. Thank you. And the final public comment is Mo Kashmiri. 
Hi, board. It's Mo Kashmiri. Just wanted to follow up. Um, today, right now, I've just got an easy one, which is we were asking you to make sure that the executive board committee follows the Brown Act. Um, since it's a regular scheduled meeting that happens regularly and has a, a, a board members on it, it also needs to be open to the public so that we can speak and be able to have a chance to listen to what's going on. Um, that hasn't been happening. I've sent an email to uh, Mr. Raul Bozio and hoping uh, we can get your help and support in making sure that the executive committee meetings are also open to the public and streamed and have a chance to do public comment. Thank you so much for all your help. Uh, thanks. Bye. We had two public comments that weren't online. Uh, Alina and Joby, do you have them online now? No, they're not online. Okay, all right. Um, item 8.1, communications, 8.1, employee organization reports, SCTA. Uh, David Fisher will be speaking for SCTA. Good evening. This morning you may have read a news story in the Sacramento Bee that finally, in May of 2021, the district is halting the $6 million order for portable air cleaners. Quote, as school officials continue to investigate whether product claims made by the global building company were true. End quote. We met with the district on December 3rd, 2020, and raised concerns about UDVI portable units recommended by Johnson Controls. We were concerned that, according to Nathaniel Browning, the district relied primarily on the recommendation of a representative from Johnson Controls to purchase the unit. That's the same vendor who sold the units. At the time of our December 3rd meeting, the purchase had been approved but had not been completed. The district could have canceled the purchase and saved $6 million. We offered to arrange a meeting between SCTA, the district, and Teresa Pistacchini, a leading national expert on ventilation, and followed up our offer in writing on December 17, 2021. Could have saved not only a big headache but a lot of money. To put it nicely, the district just blew us off. Earlier this week, we had another experience that indicated that teachers aren't alone in being ignored and disrespected. On Tuesday of this week, we attended a meeting of the Community Advisory Committee, a group of parents of Sac City students with disabilities. If you have a chance, you should check out the meeting. It was recorded. Parents, like teachers, are very frustrated by the lack of communication and follow-through from the district. It's not discussed much, but the district has recently been warned that it's at the risk of being turned over to the Department of Justice and may lose funding because of its failure to provide services to students with disabilities as required by law. While other districts enabled and supported service providers in conducting special ed assessments virtually were possible, throughout 2020, our district rejected our request to provide education, special education professionals with those tools. When we made a proposal to the district back in November of 2020, comparable to the MOUs reached in surrounding districts, that would have paved the way for resumption of in-person assessment. The district dragged its feet for another three months before reaching an agreement that was virtually the same one that we first proposed back in November. At this week's CAC meeting, parents complained of being kept in the dark and, not being, and being ignored. The district's top-down, non-responsive decision-making was noted as an area in need of immediate improvement in the report issued by the California Collaborative on Educational Excellence. The district still has not had a discussion on that report at a board meeting, nor have they invited the CCEE representatives to make a presentation of their findings. Why is that? The failure of the district to be open and accountable is well known in our community. Recently, for example, a majority of the school board took the extraordinary step of rejecting the recommendation from Superintendent Aguilar, Chief Business Officer Rose Ramos, and, and County Office of Education Superintendent Dave Gordon to certify the second interim budget as negative, and instead voted to certify the budget as qualified. Approximately three weeks later, SCOE Superintendent Dave Gordon took the unprecedented step of reversing the school board's decision and returned the budget with a negative certification. When Superintendent Aguilar and Chief Business Officer Ramos and President, Board President Pritchett shared Dave Gordon's letter with the other board members, but not with the public, they failed to provide the information that the district had the right to appeal Gordon's reversal. For the record, the second interim budget met the standard to be certified as positive in that the district will easily exceed its minimum required unrestricted reserve balance of 2% in each of the three uh, budget years. Tonight, the school board will be asked to approve the district's third interim budget, and the numbers continue to dramatically improve. It's notable that the district's third budget, third 
interim budget does not include updated numbers based on Governor Newsom's May revise, which will add tens of millions of dollars of additional ongoing dollars in Sac City. Even without those additions, CBO Ramos now projects the district will end 2021 with a $10.8 million surplus. The CBO in July 2020 projected Sac City would end the year with a $75 million deficit. The CBO, along with Superintendent Aguilar and SCOE, were also responsible for approving the purchase of the unproven and potentially unsafe $6 million portable air filters. Isn't it time to hold district ministers accountable for such huge mistakes? CDE complaints and failure to provide services to students with disabilities, forgetting to count schools in making enrollment projections, failing to provide the appropriate forms to the IRS, wildly inaccurate budget projections, all leading to labor strife. Unfortunately, tonight's school board agenda shows a continued willingness to reward top paid administrators and an unwillingness to hold them accountable. At the same time, the district is laying off hundreds of certificated and classified staff and demanding a $750 per month reduction in the average take home pay of certificated staff, you're being asked by the superintendent to approve a $34,000 pay increase for CBA Rolls Ramos. That's a 16.8% increase in pay. Since 2019, only one other district employee has seen an increase in his salary schedule, the superintendent, who vowed not to take a pay increase until the budget was qualified or, or positive. In a district which purports to have it as its operating principle, equity, access, and social justice, how can this board approve giving the CBO a $34,000 pay increase, an amount more than over half of the classified employees in the district make in a single year? If you choose to move forward with this increase, we hope that you're prepared to move forward with the same across-the-board increase for all other employees' salary schedules. Thank you. And just to be clear, every single board member on this panel um, received that letter from SCOE via board communication far before I had mentioned it on this dais. Item 9.0, special presentation. Item 9.1, approved resolutions. Hi, welcome. We have uh, two resolutions, Classified School Employees Week, May 16th to the 22nd, 2021, mm. and Mental Health Awareness Month. Yes. Good evening, Superintendent Aguilar, Board President Pritchett, and board members. My name is Christina Villegas, HR Director, and I'm here also with my colleague, Dr. Tiffany Smith-Simmons. And we are here tonight to present to you two resolutions. The first resolution, Okay, come on. I'll continue. <laughs> the first resolution is number 3206 and recognition of Classified School Employee Week. Classified School Employee Week is celebrated in the third week of May. This year it falls May 16th through May 22nd. Classified employees perform essential work for the district and the students they serve. With your approval of this resolution tonight, we are honoring, celebrating, appreciating, and recognizing the hard working classified employees of the district. Um, we would like to show you now a video compilation from administrators who wanted to recognize district classified employees. I know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura Butler, the principal at Abraham Lincoln Elementary, and I feel very confident saying that we have the absolute best classified staff in the whole district at Abraham Lincoln Elementary. I feel so lucky to work with them every single day, and I so appreciate their hard work every single day, and we couldn't do it without them. 
I want to give a special shout out to our library and media tech, Annie Cheney, who after 31 years at Abraham Lincoln is retiring and we will miss her so much, but we are very happy for her to enjoy her retirement. So again, I just want to thank the classified staff at Abraham Lincoln because they are amazing. Hi, I'm Judy Farina, president of UPE. On behalf of UPE, I would like to extend our sincerest appreciation to all the classified workers in Sacramento City Unified School District. You are the foundation of our system. You keep our schools clean and operating. You nourish our children and provide support and care for the most vulnerable students. Without you, we would not be able to function. Thank you all for keeping us moving forward. On a more personal level, a huge thank you to my classified heroes, Amanda Casau, Lupe Ramos, Jennifer Barrasoni, Raquel Anzueta, Gloria Cabi, Lisa Sumitani, Pam Hornback, and Zachary Billingsley. You are the best support team. Congratulations and thank you all for what you do for our children every day. Admin team at Wilson Wood. We would like to thank our hardworking and dedicated classified staff. You're awesome. Go Spartans! Woohoo! Good evening. I'm Roxanne Wolf. I'm the assistant principal here at Harkness Elementary. I'm giving out warm hugs to our classified here at Harkness Elementary School as well as in the district. Your job is so important to our students, to us, and their families that we could not do this job without you. Thank you. Oh, I just want to join the hug in recognition of our classified employees. Uh, I'm Ram, the director of the Office of Safe Schools, and I want to acknowledge all the great work uh, that's transpiring on the front lines at the hands of our classified employees. Uh, in conversations and engaging with stakeholders, I'm always reminded of the small gestures and the work that's transpiring every day, uh, despite pandemic, despite morale, uh, you really are finding a way to get it done. Uh, so when it comes to safety, it's all hands on deck. And I'm looking forward to gaining momentum and finding ways to work together in uh, reimagining school safety. And I just want to thank you for all your commitment and dedication to our school community. Hi there, Diana Flores, Nutrition Services at Sacramento City Unified. I want to thank our classified team members in nutrition, from our food service workers, our warehouse team, purchasing and logistics team, our supervisory team, our fiscal and office support team. They say that life is not about the work you do, it's about the people you do your work with. And um, I can't say enough about our nutrition team, especially during the pandemic, the last 14 months, really makes me proud of the work they've done every day. Thank you for inspiring me, inspiring each other to do their best work. And again, I say it all the time, magic happens when we work together. Thanks a lot, nutrition. During a visit to the NASA Space Center in 1962, President John F. Kennedy noticed a janitor carrying a broom. He interrupted his tour, walked over to the man, and said, Hi, I'm Jack Kennedy. What are you doing? Well, Mr. President, the janitor responded, I'm helping put a man on the moon. To all of our classified employees, we hear you, we see you. Thank you for the role you play in educating the students of Sacramento City Unified School District. I promise you that your work does not go unnoticed. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from our colleague, Victoria Flores, Director of Integrated Health and Support Services, to announce the next. Uh, recognition. Good evening, um, Board President uh, 
Pritchett and Superintendent Aguilar and members of the board, um, thank you. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of Resolution 30, uh, 3207, recognizing May as Mental Health Month. And you know, May has been des designated as Mental Health Awareness Month, dedicated to raising awareness of youth, their families, and really all of our community members who experience mental health or, or social emotional challenges. Um, we know that all of our community members can achieve a better quality of life with a effective, culturally relevant, and responsive services, treatment, and community support as a system of care. So moving away from that medical model to really looking at what brings us wellness and wholeness. And we know that there is hope, there is recovery, and, and that individuals can lead full and productive lives. And so we want to make sure that everyone understands that hope. And so tonight we raise that public awareness by really recognizing the importance of mental health and well-being reducing stigma, making it safe to talk about not being okay, it's okay to not be okay, um, and really supporting each other. So if you go to the next slide, we'll give you a little visual representation of how we do this in our, our district. So we send out a postcard every year. You can see that our theme really resonated with the NAMI theme, um, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, that you are not alone. You have someone. We can lend and reach a hand out to someone in whatever way that you're comfortable comfortable with, whether it's talking or texting and whatever language you're comfortable with. And one of the ways that, that we did this this month, and I'm just so I'm thrilled and honored and want to thank student board member Sheikh for his part in uh, helping us develop uh, an, a youth-based app called GRACE, and that stands for Giving Resources and Care Every Day. And this was really built by our students, for our students, with the goal of improving access to a variety variety of wellness resources in the Sacramento area. The students had the idea of creating a bot, a little, a little robot that you can actually chat with. And it gives you prompts on you know, helping students unpack how they're feeling and what they might need and leads you directly to that resource, including how to utilize that resource, text or call uh, right from the app. So we continue to build this out and develop it. But I just want to give a ton of love to everyone uh, who came together to develop this resource. And so we ask the board tonight, um, you know, to honor and recognize this uh, work by approving the board resolution. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Collins, do we need to vote on these separately? You can do them combined. Okay. All right. First, we'll go into, uh, we have no public comments, so we'll go into board discussion. I just want to say, you know, in, for um, resolution number 3206 for our classifieds, um, I agree. They uh, were our heart and soul of our district um, through this pandemic, and for them stepping up really impacted um, our, our sites, our families, they got fed. <laughs> I mean, they were just everywhere, right? And so just thank you from the bottom of our hearts from all the work that um that they did and and still continue um to do um and then for uh, resolution number 3207 um i know victoria i spoke last time that this is um this resolution means a lot this year um and i know we talk about mental health every year but i think that this year um it means more than ever because if you never thought that you had mental health issues you probably did over the last year during this pandemic right <laughs> and uh, and i know i've spoken to a lot of people about that so um with that i will if, if there's no do you have a comment okay if, Sorry, did anybody have their sign up? Oh, Member Morosky, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, you said it well. I just uh, echoed uh, so much thanks to our classified staff. You are amazing. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Victoria Flores and team for the hard work this year in meeting the social emotional needs of our students. And, you know, we've been talking about um, the, the how our students don't always know where to reach out to and you've gone and made that conversation into an app that <laughs> students can directly connect with the resources they need and i love it i downloaded it i was kind of crying because of how cool it is and how like just you know really useful i think it's going to be so i just wanted to um uh give, give a shout out to that uh, amazing work thank you and i'm happy to move it at the right time 
All right, I have a first, uh, and Mr. Wu, board okay. member. Okay, I got a first and a second. Member Garcia. Yeah, I just want to make some brief comments um, to the Flores Square team. So um, both um, Victoria Flores for all the amazing work in the mental health space and um, and really um, hitting, not missing a beat in terms of knowing where the where the student needs are and how to how to meet those needs. And also um, to Anna Flores for her team and ensuring that our kids don't go hungry and her team really stepping up and making sure that they're passing out meals for breakfast and lunch um, since, the, since the shutdown. And I think as of now, it's open over 10 uh, million meals that have been distributed. And this doesn't go without saying that all classified staff has been essential to making sure that services are still accessible to our students despite the um, the shutdown um, last um, spring. So just wanted to recognize that. Thank you. And, and continuing to be essential to make sure our classrooms are clean and sanitized as our kids are coming back and our staff is coming back into the sites. All right, I have a first and a second for resolution 3206 and 3207, student preferential vote. Aye. All right, superintendent, roll call. Member Pritchett? Aye. Member Morawski? Aye. Member Wu? Aye. Member Garcia? Aye. Member Villa? Aye. Member Rhodes? Aye. Member Phillips? Aye. Perfect. Thank you for everyone's hard work. All right. Item 9.2, Seal of Biliteracy Awards. Ms. Fieda and Mr. Cherky. Okay, well, good evening, uh, Superintendent and members of the board. My name is Matt Turkey, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. And um, I'm being joined here tonight by our ELD training specialist, Melanie Bean. And we're very excited to be here tonight to celebrate the student recipients of the State Seal of Biliteracy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the State Seal of Biliteracy is a recognition which is conferred by the State Superintendent of Public Instruction for graduating high school students who have attained a high level of proficiency in speaking, reading, and writing in one or more languages in addition to English. And uh, I will now hand over to my colleague, Melanie Bean, who will take you through the numbers. Melanie, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Um, my name is Melanie Bean, and my pronouns are she, her, and I work in the Multilingual Literacy Office. Um, if you could go ahead and go to the next slide, I'd like to thank the superintendent and board members this evening for celebrating and amplifying the achievements of 582 multiliterate seniors that are graduating from 11 of our high schools. Go ahead and go to slide four, please. These amazing youth have earned the state seal of biliteracy in 17 languages, which you'll see on the next slide. So slide number six, the qualifications for seal of biliteracy were a little bit different this year. Um, all seniors had to demonstrate that they had a cumulative 2.0 GPA in all of their English classes all four years. You could go to slide six, please. And now to slide seven. This year was a little bit different. Um, this year we had more English learners than ever take the Sacramento County Office of Education language exam. And many of those students were newcomers, which has not been um, allowed in the past. So that was really exciting to be able to acknowledge the language assets of all of our students. Uh, next slide, please. I'm also excited to say that we have a ton of seniors taking the AP test right now, and 210 of them are taking AP world language exams. So these seniors also have the opportunity of earning the state seal of biliteracy this summer. Slide nine. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize six students who got the state seal of biliteracy in two or more languages, which is on our next slide. 
So CT Kai, Jean Rouli, and Liang Yozu from CK McClatchy got the state seal in Cantonese and Mandarin. Queen Fa Lu from Hiram Johnson also got the state seal in Cantonese and Mandarin. And then we have sisters from Luther Burbank High School. I believe they're joining us tonight on the call, so hi. Um, we have Sarzenga Amin, who got the state seal in Dari and Farsi. And we have an amazing senior who got the state seal in three languages, Fatima Amin in Dari, Farsi, and Pashtu. In slide 11, I'd also like to recognize a student from Rosemont High School, Kuan Nguyen Lee, who received a state seal of biliteracy scholarship from CABE, California Association of Bilingual Education. At this time, I'd like to now present a short video that highlights the achievements of our state seal of biliteracy recipients. This is a shortened video. I encourage our families to uh, go to the multilingual literacy website to see the full presentation. Go ahead and show the video. Thanks, everybody.
All right. Thank you so much. I love that video. I believe we have uh, two live comments. Yes, the first one is Terrence Gladney. Qué fantástico. Uh, felicidades a todos los estudiantes. Uh, estudié por cuatro años en escuela secundaria en Berkeley. Um, I just said congratulations to all the students. Um, I took four years of high school Spanish at Berkeley High. I also participated in a uh, Spanish exchange uh, program in Calquini Campeche. Um, it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life, not only to undertake a different language, but also to experience a culture. Um, and it is fantastic. It should be right at the top of our priorities to encourage, not only encourage, but also, uh, you know, push kids into foreign language. Um, many schools have a precedent set where they say the UC or CSU student, uh, you know, will take a foreign language in their first year of high school, but many don't encourage students to do so, which means that we're already tracking our kids before they even engage in high school experience. The eighth graders schedules are set in eighth grade. So that means that before they even step foot on that high school as a student, they have been pre-identified as a, US, a UC or CSU bound student or not. Um, I have two scholars of mine, one being my daughter. Um, my daughter's in French. She was informed a couple weeks ago that there's no AP French available. Um, and basically, she was told that it's okay because, you know, UCs and CSUs, they, they, only, they only require two years and recommend three, so it's okay. We're going to correct our course catalog. And if she wanted to go above and beyond and undertake that study, you know, it, at Sac City, it's okay, but that would be going above and beyond. Um, shouldn't we change the language to encourage them? And shouldn't the onus be on the district to provide those opportunities once a student engages in a pathway to say that we're going to guarantee that you have access to that pathway through its completion to the highest level possible at any school? I have another student who's a sophomore, but she was already in the Mandarin 3 class and was redirected to Johnson because there weren't enough students at her school site. They consolidate students from across the district and that class was canceled. So now the responsibility is on her and her family to find adequate equivalent uh, curriculum at Sac City. Again, if we're going to stick true to our words and provide the greatest number of opportunities, if a student undertakes a foreign language, we need to commit to ensuring them all the way through that language so that they can become fluent. If the, if, if, if the seal of biliteracy is four years, my daughter doesn't have the opportunities to complete her four years because of a failure of our district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gladney. Next comment, Shayla. Mo Kashmiri. Hi, everybody. Mo Kashmiri. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the board. Earlier, there were a couple of rounds of cuts to the bilingual program, and this board reversed them. I wanted to say thank you to that and say instead of, you know, and I think this biliteracy is the way to go, and it's absolutely one of the strengths of our school district. Uh, and I'd ask you that you expand the program. I know at William Land, we have a waiting list for kids who don't end up getting in uh, to the Chinese dual, Mandarin dual immersion program. We want your support to expand these programs. We know this is what draws folks the district and this is a great program so that's it thanks thank you do we have any board comments member Rhodes. oh no. sorry member garcia <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned this at the last board meeting. Um, a couple of us uh, joined the um, the regional celebration um, of, for these recipients to be recognized as um, uh, students earning a seal of biliteracy. Uh, the Sacramento County Office of Education hosted that um, regional celebration. Um, I just want to congratulate all the recipients. This is a great accomplishment as someone who is bilingual um, in English and Spanish. I, um, I do wish all our students had the opportunity to learn m um, many languages, not just another language. But um, I did have some questions regarding um, the path, the most common path in our district to um, secure a seal of biliteracy. And, um, and then also wanted to um, find out in terms of um, next steps to, um, as one of the uh, public commenters mentioned, how do we ensure that we are um, providing those opportunities of access to um, to meet the um, uh, the requirements and um, and and those paths? I'm thinking of uh, maybe concurrent enrollment 
um, this, the state has encouraged school districts to um, enter into partnerships with community colleges so that um, many more opportunities are available to students if districts don't have that expertise. So I just wanted to see um, where maybe that may that that conversation may be. Um, I'll certainly let um, uh, Melanie speak to at least the, the first question there. So, uh, Melanie. Fantastic. Thank you, Board Member Garcia, for bringing that up and for the public comments about um, the necessary steps to move forward with promoting our multilingual, multiliterate students. This is in accordance to CDE's Global 2030 initiative that we provide um, world language opportunities for our young people. Um, right now, we are trying to build our world language program and include heritage language classes. There are some sites that are building their heritage language program um, to be a direct pathway from our dual immersion sites. That being said, there really isn't a middle school pathway right now, right? They, they go to elementary school, then there's like this middle school, and then there's high school heritage language programs. So that's something that we would like to work on. Additionally, any student can take an AP class. So if the class is not offered, the student still does have the opportunity to take an AP test. Um, but that does not negate the necessity to have those programs um, offered at the sites. Um, thank you. And um, so I, I look forward to hearing more on, on how we plan to fill those gaps, opportunity gaps and access. And um, I also want to uh, recognize all the English learners who um, also who are also recipients of the Seal of Biliteracy. So thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a fabulous work. Um, being bilingual myself, my uh, now I'm on. Now I'm on. There you go. So it's a uh, amazing work. Um, in my household, we have native speakers, we have heritage speakers, and we have uh, you know English. I mean Spanish is second language uh, speakers, and so we have the gambit. And in our household, we speak Spanish. And I think that um, speaking of my own children who are in uh, dual immersion classes and have and they see that gap of being in dual emergence since kindergarten. And then at seventh grade, they have nothing. Uh, luckily at Burbank, they have um, built out their heritage program for heritage speakers and the IB heritage and, and native speaker programs. Um, but we miss a huge number of students in that middle school section. Um, and, and I believe as a district, um, we, we see the, the uh, effects of what could happen when students have access, um, but imagine uh, where their outcomes could be with a better connectivity, and if we do that as a district. Um, so I look forward to working on this. Um, it's, it's something that is very at the top of my list of kind of filling those gaps, um, and, and it also assists our EL students, but also students that uh, want to learn another language, and as they have their careers, as they get older to have better options as well and so I'm, I'm excited by this i think by filling the gap uh, we can have even more uh, awardees in our district um, and this is uh very exciting so uh para todos ustedes que reciben eso uh, felicidades and um we can continue to grow so thank you guys for your time thank you member Rhodes. to the member shake thank you president bridget um so I'll just go back 12 years. Um, my mom liked to tell the story of how before I started kindergarten, um, one day I started crying to her because I didn't know English. Um, and so I was born in America, but my parents were very intentional about not speaking English with me until I started kindergarten um, because they wanted me to be biliterate. Um, and, you know, it was, it, it's funny because this year I did a lot of things, including work the election. Um, and there would be these voters who were coming in to vote for the first time, um, and they had no idea how to do any of it. And so 
in our day-to-day -day life in a city like this in a district like this by literacy is so important and i just want to congratulate every single one of the students receiving the seal um i didn't show up to my test so i'm actually not receiving the seal on my diploma <laughs> um, but hopefully um, a lot of the students um, had a good and seamless uh, experience i know that staff were working hard at the site level to ensure that students uh, if they were not in those ap classes if they're they were taking those SCOE tests um, and so as much as there are gaps here and i, I know member Rhodes that talks about some of them but um i think there was a lot of great work in ensuring that students who wanted this seal and who were qualified could get it and i want to thank all the staff and i want to thank all the students um and i do want to congratulate everything I, I saw friends of mine in that slideshow and i know kiwan is going to college with me um and so you know just great work fantastic thank you all right well with that uh, i'd like to just one, one more time congratulate all of our award winners and um and and i agree um yes thank you <laughs> i agree um I, it was it's kind of saddening to me because in prior years we would have had all of them here in our boardroom and we could be celebrating with them and it's so emotional and and fantastic to be with all of our students so just know that we're we're here for you we're rooting for you and uh and you know where to come back if you ever need help <laughs> um and I, and I also look forward to expanding the programs for sure i don't i don't know if it even qualifies for the seal of biliteracy but sign language so we need to have like sign language in there right and um, I know my daughter took that in college and talked all the time about the importance of like kids knowing sign language. Um, so with that, congratulations one more time. We're very proud of you. All right, on to the next agenda topic, 9.3, update on reopening memorandums of understanding and next steps. Who will be presenting on this, Superintendent? Uh, thank you, President Pritchett. We're going to have a, a number of our staff um, who are ready to present. Um, our in-house legal counsel, Mr. Bozio, is not here today, uh, but we do have uh, other staff that are going to be providing an update on this important item for our board and our community. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, President Pritchett, members of the board, and Superintendent Aguilar. I am Christine Vieta, and in service as your Chief Academic Officer. And I'll be presenting most of this this evening. And then we have also here with us this evening folks that can help if there are additional questions or needs. So our our reopening update for you this evening is really about our combining cohorts and what that looks like across the district. And so that's what we'll be sharing this evening as part of our reopening update. We'll stay on that topic. Next slide, please. First and foremost, we know that the current physical distancing guidelines tell us that we can have three feet between students. So CD, CDC, CDPH, SCDPH, Sacramento County Department of Public Health, all allow for three feet of distancing between students in classrooms. And I'd like to share a quote, Mr. Bozio shared this in, in a previous presentation, and this is from a CDE fact page on AB 86 that an LEA with more than sufficient space, staffing, hygienic supplies to ensure health and safety of all students should be offering full day and full week in-person instruction to all of its students. So as we discuss tonight combining cohorts or putting our A and B in-person cohorts together in Sac City Unified, here's why this is important, because this updated physical distancing guidance would allow us to bring back more of our students safely and we would be able to increase the capacity the smiles behind the masks in all of our classrooms next slide please here i'd like to share and remind you of the constraints of combining cohorts based on this three feet guidance first and foremost section 1a of our mou with scta provides that the district will comply with all of the in place guidelines in section a3 of the mou with scta it's provided that all revisions and updates to the above health and safety guidelines but if any provision contained conflicts with or revised, if any, if there are any revisions to a guideline that we agree that we would meet and confer. 
So we want you to know that we continue to request to meet. It is our continued hope that we are able to adopt these updated guidelines. As we have said, and as we all know, our students need this. Our students need to be in person. They need to be with each other and they need to be with their teachers. Next slide, please. We know that updating our physical distancing guidelines requires a meet and confer. We know that's in our MOU and we know that that's required. However, we also know now that combining cohorts at six feet physical distancing does not require an MOU with our labor partners. And we have moved forward with our combining without that MOU. Again, I want to hear recognize and acknowledge that using this outdated six foot distancing guideline reduces the number of our students who we are able to serve in person. So as we continue to see some of the data as we move forward, just know that we're operating within these constraints. So next slide, please. What have we been able to do? And, and I do share joy for what we have been able to do, although we still continue to need all of our students to be able to be in person. Our efforts to provide more person instruction started on May 18th. We began combining cohorts and we've been phasing this in. So we started with our early kindergarten through sixth grade class cohorts. Wherever we, will, we were able to do that safely with that six feet student to student distancing. And I'd like to take this moment to really share my deep gratitude to our principals because this work has really been led by the knowledge they have of their students and in classes. We provided for our principals data that we were able to pull here centrally and our data team did an amazing job. They kept updating it because it really changes sometimes very quickly. But our principals walked the classrooms to determine where everywhere they could bring cohorts back and do the combining they confirmed where they could combine they communicated with families on any changes and they really worked hard to make sure that this week as we combine these cohorts it was very smooth for our families and i want to as a former principal and bringing my former principal heart to this work thank them for this transition they've worked very very hard to make sure that this could happen for our families so thank you to our principals next slide please so now let's take a look at what this looks like by the numbers so as we move toward this unified goal of making sure that all of our kids are on campus all day and every day here's what we have been able to do 700 of over 1000 of our elementary classrooms at 47 sites have been able to have some combining. It's important board and community to know that across our district, there are some schools where we were able to combine all of our classrooms and that happened at 12 sites. At a lot of our schools though, we were able to combine some classrooms, but not all. And that might even be one third grade classroom, but not another third grade classroom. Six of our sites were unable to combine just based on the six feet distancing space in those classrooms. Six sites were unable to do any combining at all. Next slide, please. We currently have in service in EK through sixth grade, we're serving 21,928, almost 22,000 students. And I wanted to share for you where those students are right now. So you see that in a two day a week model, we have cohort A students, a little over 3,500 of those 23,000. In cohort B, another 3,500. We have 9,000, which is around 41% of our elementary students that are still in distance learning. And then we currently have close to 6,000 students that are four days a week in person. This is good, this is really good news, but as Superintendent Aguilar continues to say, every minute is so valuable and we need our students here with us every single minute, all of our students. Next slide, please. I want to share with you the work that needs to be done and where what work is happening now. 
I want to shout out again to our principals. They, um, they asked, even if we cannot combine classrooms, is there any way that based on need, we can increase the size safely of classrooms, remain within six feet of so social distancing, and be able to serve more of our students in class? And we went to work to make that happen. So beginning next week, we will partially combine cohorts to accommodate students based on need to so, so that they can attend four days a week. We are also analyzing in our secondary principals, as soon as they saw this starting to happen, they started looking at their own data and walking their own campuses to see, is it possible for us? It's more complicated in secondary. If you could think through for a moment that if a student attends first, third, and fifth periods in a day, we may be able to combine first period and fifth period, but not third period. So that would put our students in a situation where they would need to be in distance learning, perhaps, on two of those days a week while they actually were on campus, or maybe even need to transition back to their home and miss some of their synchronous learning or small group time with their teachers. So it's more complicated in our secondary space, but our secondary instructional assistant superintendents and their principals have been looking at their data, and we already see that there are several schools where we can either combine completely or combined partially. And we're preparing to be able to do that for our students. Next slide, please. We also wanted to leave you with some of the, our concerns, which we know are your concerns and they're the common concerns. It's important to understand that many of our students are not able to come back in person four days a week because we are currently at six feet versus three feet. We also know that because we need to return students based on six feet and not being able to combine everywhere, we've created a situation where one sibling might be able to return four days a week while another is not able. We understand and acknowledge that that puts some pressure on our families with transportation as well as childcare. We know that we've had some inventory challenges with technology issues. Sac City Unified, like all other schools across the school, the state and across our country, have been scrambling to get our, our hands on any technology that we can. We have, we have Chromebooks that continue to come in, but we acknowledge that we have had some inventory cha challenges with our technology issues. And for this last bullet, I'd like us all to think for a moment that we've heard from our community and we share the concern that the three hours a day does not in any way equate to a full day of learning with peers or with your teacher. We know that that's true. And we also know that there are only four weeks left of school. But Superintendent Aguilar continues to remind us that we do not look at this in days or in hours. We know that for our students, every single minute of powerful instruction that we can provide them, every single minute that we can provide them with time with their peers, every single minute counts. And I'd like to go next slide, please. And share a little video if we have this queued up. When we think about every minute counts, here's why every minute counts. And I bet that video is going to start any moment. Or maybe not. <laughs> and if, if not, they're getting um, it. They're getting oh, it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I was told when I was a new teacher, quiet classroom is a good classroom. The teacher does the talking and the students listen. A lot of us were told this. Then we had a pandemic and we feel this longing deep in our bones 
for the noise, the sound of an excited child, the laughing at jokes that you can't hear when they're muted on Zoom, kids gasping in wonder when an experiment works, the instant increase in volume in a hallway when the bell rings, class discussions, laughter, the lunchroom, walking by another classroom and hearing so much noise coming from the cracks in the door that you can't stop smiling because that teacher might have some engaged students. This year has been quieter, and maybe we thought we'd like the quiet. Maybe the noise drove us a little crazy sometimes, but there's something about an empty classroom that doesn't feel right, or the sound of muffled voices behind masks that doesn't seem to have the same effect. In this past year, we've done what was necessary, and some magic still happened, but this time has taken its toll. Perhaps you miss the noise. Because the noise often means that kids are loving learning. They feel comfortable enough to let down their guards and express their emotions. The noise can work as an affirmation that as a teacher, you are doing something right. There's something about your class that your students love, and they love it enough to make some noise. A quiet classroom is a good classroom? Maybe sometimes. Sometimes we need quiet. You need quiet. Your students need quiet. But I've also learned that there is nothing wrong with a little controlled chaos. Laughing out loud, heated discussions, student collaboration, building relationships, the sound of joy, frustration, energy, performance, wonder, curiosity, hands raised and calling to be called on noise. And so as we begin to emerge from this pandemic, which along with so many other challenges has carried with it a lot of silence, let's not forget the things that we miss most. And perhaps one of those for you is the sound of learning, the sound of an engaged classroom, of a class debate or a spoken word poetry slam, or loud group work, or desks scraping across the floor, or the music you love to play before class, or that one kid who loves to make the rest of the class laugh, of Friday nights under the lights, or the sound of pencils scrawling across paper, or that feeling at the end of the day when it's finally quiet, that earned silence. Let's not forget the noise, and let's embrace it as it returns. Thank you to our teachers for everything you've done to help us get through this year. We appreciate you so much. And now we'll take um, questions, if there are any questions. Thank you. I believe we have um, 17 live comments for this agenda topic. So uh, with only allowing 15 minutes, I'll allow all 17 comments at one minute per comment. First, we have Brenda Wolfson. Ingrid Hutchins. Good evening again. I'll be combining my time with Holly Conway, Amy Smith, and Beth Conklin. My name is Ingrid Hutchins, and I'm a second grade teacher at Golden Empire Elementary. I'm seriously concerned with the planning for fall instruction. As I pointed out during the last board meeting, the language in the fall opening resolution was weak in regard to opening a virtual academy for our distance learners. The resolution stated that the district only needed to study how to best accomplish this. That's not a commitment nor a mandate. It only requires that they try. Why is weak language an issue? As of last week, the district's academic office hadn't started the paperwork necessary to get state approval for a virtual academy. They also hadn't looked into the process yet, so they were completely unaware of how long the process takes. There's no incentive to get this done because the resolution does not require it. This creates a huge problem for our district. 
we will have families who are not ready to return to our campuses in the fall. What is your plan for educating their children? Who will be educating their children? How will that take place? My fear is that the district will fall back on using the concurrent model if nothing else is in place by then. This would be devastating. Concurrent teaching is not quality teaching. Our students deserve to have teachers who are dedicated to them and their instructional model. I've been appalled at the attitude that some in the district office have toward the educational rights of our students to remain in the distance learning model. Telling teachers to just focus on the students who are in the classroom is an egregious suggestion that borders on educational malpractice. Board members, I implore you to ensure that all of our students receive the education they deserve in the fall, not just the students who are returning to campus. As area trustees, your duty is to oversee that every single student in your area is receiving the best educational experience possible. That can't happen if you only focus on the on-campus students. I also want to discuss the ongoing push to reduce the distance between students in our classroom. We have 19 school days left in the school year. Yes, every moment of that time is precious. If a classroom has a confirmed case, the students in that class will have their in-person days cut substantially. Reducing the space between students in our classroom won't improve the quality of education. In some cases, it will reduce it. Teachers need space to monitor student work or to use proximity as a classroom management technique. Movement through the room is an important engagement technique utilized by classroom teachers. We're also still waiting for some of the equipment the district promised us, such as two portable CO2 monitors per site and reliable Wi-Fi. We shouldn't be discussing further reducing physical distance when the district hasn't followed through with the agreements necessary to reopen at six feet. I hear many people use the CDC's guidelines as their rationale to reduce the distance between students. What I don't hear discussed are the caveats embedded within the guidelines. Missing from the conversation are key phrases, such as at least, which implies you can use more, when there is universal and correct use of masks, and we all know young students require mask reminders numerous times a day. But the most important thing missing from the discussions is certain racial and ethnic groups have borne a disproportionate, disproportionate burden of illness and serious outcomes from COVID-19. These health disparities are evident even among school-aged children, suggesting that in-person instruction might pose a greater risk of COVID-19 to disproportionately affected populations. For these reasons, health equity considerations related to in-person instruction are an integral part of this complex decision-making. I have not heard the concern for the health of our students and staff taken into consideration. If we're truly an equitable district, shouldn't the risk of all populations be taken into account when considering reducing distance? Member Garcia, at the last board meeting, you stated that we should reduce to three feet because other districts have figured it out. I respectfully counter that with the fact that we aren't like other districts. Our demographics do not match other districts. We need to look at the disproportionate risk Ms. that Hutchins, our students, wrap it up. Thank you. That our students, staff members, and families would bear if we try to emulate districts with vastly different demographics. Instead of trying to change things yet again this year, let's focus on a strong finish. Let's focus on keeping everyone healthy. Let's focus on keeping all of our classrooms open for the last few days of the school year. Thank you. Thank you. Next comment, Desiree Throckmorton. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I am just a mom of a fifth grader and a seventh grader. I'm not a lawyer or a politician. I am just so tired of this nonsense of homeschool. I understand the rest of this year, let's just finish it out. I'm not looking for significant change now, but for the fall, I'm desperate for the fall. I'm not alone in that desperation. Distance learning is causing significant stress for families like myself and for the kids who are just bored suffering through Zoom education. I see it in my own home. I see it in the, the, the care that they don't put into school right now. The emotional toll on the children should be enough to motivate everybody to get these kids in school where they belong. In the fall, the fall should be the focus. We need a plan, we need a direction. The purpose of school is to prepare these kids for the future, for the college, for moving forward in life. And we're not doing that, we're failing there. And we need to fix that. Attending school three hours twice a week is not even getting close to that. 
moving Thanks, forward. Desiree. Thank you. John Myers. Good evening, uh, board members and superintendent. This is John Myers speaking on behalf of the 500 members of Open Open Sac City Schools. This week, we sent the board and superintendent a letter with 175 signatures, uh, and that's now uh, 225 signatures and growing. In the letter, the parents of Open Sac City Schools uh, shared two urgent requests. The first one's easy. Uh, have reopening discussions explicitly on every board agenda until all students are back in class. Multiple board members have already committed to this. We're not talking about MOU updates, although those might be included in the reopening discussions, but actual student-centric reopening agenda items. The second urgent item is to immediately adopt three-foot spacing where needed to equitably combine cohorts for all students, not just a lucky few. We understand that MOU with SCTA states eight feet, uh, six feet and a commitment to meet and confer on three foot spacing. It's been eight weeks since CDC and CDPH updated their classroom spacing to three feet. MOUs are informal non-binding agreements built on the good faith of both parties. It's been very apparent for many weeks that SCT, SCTA has no interest in discussing three foot spacing in good faith. David, Mr. Myers, please wrap it up. Six response that six foot is greater than three feet. I made this clear five weeks ago. It's been eight weeks. When will when will we move past this agreement? June, August, September. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Jamie James. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my comment is in support of the goal of a normal, deserved five full days in-person schooling this year. Um, that video that we watched earlier, first of all, can I just say that was totally moving. I, I really, those are the simple things that I miss so much. Um, my children go to school a total of six hours a week. Um, and it's made the distance learning part even more difficult. We're increasingly disengaged at home. And we are unfortunately not some of the lucky schools that get to combine cohorts. Um, every other district has recognized three feet spacing and it works. And we should be acknowledging that as well. Three feet spacing will improve learning. A strong finish equals more days in person and i just hope that we can talk more about this um james all right thank you thank you jason span good evening um once again stating my support for a return to five days a week in person morning as soon as possible if you're tired of hearing from me you're not alone, as I too am tired of hearing myself advocate for what seems so obvious for the mental and academic benefit of our community's kids. As COVID-19 rates continue to remain low and vaccinations are increasing, including vaccination or opportunity to vaccinate. Our, all district employees is an embarrassment to the community and a disservice to the district's kids that the district is not yet back to full time yeah, distance learning, otherwise known as school. Labor union leadership have once again successfully blocked steps for district students to try to catch up with the majority of other public and private schools by continuing to not deny the science and sticking to a six foot physical distance rule. My kids and many others will not be allowed to attend four days a week as part of a plan to collapse cohorts because of this. Labor union leaderships committed to stifling student academic and mental health success is truly remarkable. I fear like many others that this inability to accept scientific evidence may lead to continued efforts to block a return to five days a week in-person learning in the fall. Thank I you. appreciate the districts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Serena Fuller. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Serena. I'm a parent of a first grader at Caleb Greenwood and a special shout out to member Garcia who represents my district. I really want y'all to get back to four to five days of in-person instruction for the remainder of the school year, this school year. I didn't really know how important it was, 
but my kid was so excited to go back to in person and like literally just last week even though we've been doing this for a while now in zoom i found her crying on the floor because her teacher couldn't didn't see she was raising her hand she couldn't engage in class and she loves her teacher her teacher is awesome but her teacher has kids in class and on zoom so how does that work so this brings me to my action items first i want to say i know it's really really hard between you and sceta but cool Go forward with the MOU, update it. But if you can't, it's okay to use your authority and collapse those elementary school cohorts so we can get all the students back in those four days a week. And um, you know what? We might have to be doing a Zoom out as a parent in protest and have those withheld absences. And I say to you, if not here, where? If not now, when? Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Merrill. Hi, so Christina Pritchett said that in previous years, you guys would have had the celebration in person. In previous years, our children would have been in school full time. I have watched your board there the whole time and you guys look like bored school children in front of their teacher who have been on zoom far too long this is the first board meeting i've been to and you look like you need to get out of the school out of the zoom and into school our children need the same thing my daughter has been in school full time before you guys started in twice a week three three hours a day at natomas charter seven miles away my family has been in school full time in other states for many many months stop the incalcitrance listen to science force the teachers to come back i know it's inconvenient and we only have a few months left we parents some of us pay for a couple of of weeks thank you miss Mayo. for our children to go to summer camp our kids want to be together you guys need to step up and get our kids back in the classroom thank you miss Mayo. karen rice Good evening. I've spoken now several times about opening schools to the full ex extent possible. Um, again, I'm a parent here in the district as well as an educator outside of the district. I talked last time about the growing sense of hopelessness in, among parents. Last month's commitment to open in the fall gave a little bit of hope. However, there's still the reality that currently we are adhering to outdated guidelines, and there is still the looming reality of what was referred to earlier as the toxic negotiation process. At the April 22nd meeting, I heard union representatives who immediately threatened to strike at the start of the next school year if negotiations this summer don't go their way. This was, of course, just after a strike was avoided. As an educator, I have a real problem with any threat to strike when children have been deprived of a full education for over a year. It's just plain appalling. This and the fact that the MOU language still reflects old guidelines is why union members are currently seeing parent support waning. That is the reason. Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, has stated that the AFT will continue to push to maintain the three foot distancing they are currently following when they fully reopen in the fall. So one of the largest unions in the country is currently following the science. Why isn't ours? Price, please. Maybe it's time for our union to agree. Maybe it's time for this board to finally say that we need to forget the MOU and collapse our cohorts and get our students back to school now. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Rice. Julia Del Agua. Hello, I just want to quickly say uh, that I encourage uh, the district to look into virtual academy in the fall for those students that it will benefit. And then also uh, looking 
uh, towards a full in-person return in the fall. Um, I'm a parent with kids, but I'm also a teacher. And um, my um, curriculum has been extremely hindered by uh, distance learning because I can't do most of the hands-on stuff that I normally would. And um, not knowing what's going to happen in the fall um, is difficult because I need to replan if things are not going to go back to normal um, where I can't do my normal curriculum. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeLaga. Renee Webster Hawkins. Renee, are you there? Terrence Gladney. Good evening again. Um, I want to preface this by saying um, I undertook uh, teaching and I also support um, technology needs at my school, which is outside of Sac City, to be clear. Um, but I've been in the classroom since September. Um, it's not an easy task. I teach TK through eight, so I have the perspective to actually know what that experience is like, and I'm also a parent. Let me say that I am the parent of a 4.0 plus black student who has not jumped at the opportunity to return to school. And there are many in our district, if we look at the numbers, the percentages say that less than 50% of our students have jumped at the opportunity to return to what we have built. So apparently if we build it, they shall not come. Um, perhaps they're opting out of a system that has generationally failed them. So let's not listen to 500 people who have signed a paper who perhaps have a school system or local schools that serve them quite well and they are in a hurry to return there. Let's look at our opportunity to correct the wrongs and meet our responsibility to all students. Let's not say that the community has spoken because I think that the predominant amount of community has said that we're not returning to a broken school system and that is what has shown by their actions. So let's honor their actions and not just the voices of a few who have the ability to dial in and, and speak on a Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mo Kashmiri. Hi, this is Mo Kashmiri here. Just wanted to echo what folks are saying. I don't think there's consensus on returning to school five days a week for the last month um, because it would cause folks who are in uh, distance learning to potentially lose access to their teachers. That's not okay. And I think we're complete, they're completely right when we talk about needing to focus on the virtual academy now. We've got to be hiring the principals, getting the approvals, making that happen. It's not an easy process. We need to make sure that we're moving now so that we're not uh, behind other school districts. Thanks. Thank you. And our last comment is from Angie Sutherland. Hello, um, I'm also combining my comment with Renee. That's why she didn't. Oh, speak OK, up, perfect. So. Thank you. We'll give you two minutes. OK, so I'm I'm Angela Sutherland. I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Students with Disabilities. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, to Miss Bieda for highlighting that the current physical distancing guidance is three feet between students and that following the CDC guidelines increases the possibility of collapsing the cohorts to provide more access for all students. If this, if this happens, um, the distance learning academy should still be available. So hopefully that is that would not go away. Um, because there's a lot of students that are th are thriving um, in the distance option. Um, in addition, I want to talk about the MOU um, on alternative assessments that was reached. Um, I think that this should have been part of the presentation as well. Um, and then lastly, the special education assessments. Um, students with disabilities have waited long enough to receive the services that they're entitled to by law. Uh, we're really appreciative of the district's statement on their website that reminds us that providing our students with critical services required by law isn't voluntary. This work is an everyday part of meeting our students' academic, social, and emotional needs. We also appreciate the district's FAQ with, that provides more updated assessment information, including a list that's updated every Wednesday with the numbers of students needing assessments. We ask that this topic remain on the agenda at every board meeting and CAC meeting until students are provided with the assessment services they're legally entitled to. 
And um, we ask also that the board members, the district legal administrators and staff show that they're taking this matter seriously by displaying a sense of urgency and care about the students with disabilities whose needs are not being met and the awareness of the impacts to them. We echo the comments of fellow parents on this issue. One parent provided a written comment for this item, said it so nicely. Our kids are not pawns in this game. Please stand up to the SCTA. We ask for your bold action based on the student needs rather than continuing the decades long practice of allowing the collective bargaining process to impede or trump student rights to a quality and inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. That was the last comment. Yes. Okay, perfect. I will open this up for board discussion. Uh, before I call on any of our board members, I'd like to read a statement on behalf of the board regarding the reopening of our schools. We officially welcome back students um, to in-person learning on April 8th by implementing extensive protocols to protect the health and safety of students and staff, meeting conditions that go above and beyond both state and county health requirements, as well as CDC recommendations for reopening. We, we started our return to learn with students who opted in for in-person instruction returning to our school sites two days a week. On April 22nd, 2021, our board unanimously adopted a resolution led by our very own student board member, Isa Sheik. Board, the, um, Expressing our commitment to, to bring students back into in-person learning to the greatest extent possible during the remainder of the current 2020-21 school year. Beginning this week, the district combined cohorts into those classrooms uh, um, where it can be done, or I'm sorry, let me back that up. This, the district combined cohorts into the classrooms where it can be done while still maintaining a six feet, dif a six feet of difference per our MOU with SCTA and SEIU. We are now working to bring back additional students into those classrooms where cohorts cannot fully combine. Given these requirements, with the goal being to bring back as many of our students with the highest needs and, the, and consistent with the mandates of Senate Bill 86 for four days of in-person support. This will include working to bring back more of, our, more of our students experiencing homelessness, students with disabilities, students who have been chronically disengaged from schools, English language learners, and students at risk of abuse. The board, sorry, the board remains fully committed to working with our labor partners as needed to ensure that, it, that as many of our students um, um, as possible return before the end of the school year, the current school year. Additionally, we are fully committed to working to ensure that all district students will be able to return to full in-person instruction five days a week on the first day of the 21-22 academic school year. It is important to remember that in making important decisions about district operations, including school reopening, the board must adhere to the terms and conditions negotiated with our labor partners consistent with labor laws. The district has reached out to SCTA numerous times and continues to address the issue of combining cohorts and bringing back more students at the three feet distance because we know that the science supports the distancing. Staff has also been engaged in the analysis of our classrooms to ensure that the additional students can be accommodated as cohorts are combined and more students return. We have heard from our superintendent and chief academic officer speak about the role um, that assessments that play, play during in returning our students to the school in the fall and mitigating the impacts of the COVID-19 has on um, student learning and educational process. We know, sorry, it's really hard to read all of this with a mask on. <laughs> we know, we now have an agreement with SCTA on year-end assessments for the current school year, which will allow for our educators to have access to data 
that will allow them to better understand the effects of the pandemic uh, on our students and to identify the areas of focus for the upcoming school year. Although such agreement is not precedent setting and only applicable for a one-time administration to meet the state requirements, we will continue to request engagement with SCTA regarding comprehensive student assessments for the next school year. You may ask why, and I want to be clear that our commitment is to is this to be centered on being able to monitor school uh, student progress and make adjustments to teaching to meet the needs of all of our students throughout the 21-22 school year. But it's also an appropriate way for us to monitor whether our investments are yielding positive results for our students across our city. Candidly, our foundational for us is to begin transformi transformative work and ensure that our students are appropriately allocating resources to serve all of our or that our superintendents appropriately alloc allocating resources to serve all of our students in Sacramento City Unified. The district will continue to take necessary steps to ensure that all of our schools remain open and that um, Sacramento City Unified students are provided the opportunity to attend it, um, school in person. These opportunities would not be possible without the hard work of our staff, who is constantly rise that constantly rise to meet the demands of this challenging time and we want to publicly acknowledge their efforts thank you with that i will take board comments and questions i think i saw student member uh shakes thank you so i do have a couple questions for staff is there an echo yikes okay Okay, um, so I do have a couple questions, but before then, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, okay, so when we talk about three feet, which has been, gosh, I don't even know how many months we've heard from national and international authorities saying that that's the correct number. Um, I don't understand what the point is. God, even last time there was audio problems during my time. <laughs> Somebody in the audio is trying to sabotage me. Are we good? I think we're good. Okay. Anyways, I don't understand what the case being made here is by bringing up health disparities by saying we can't go down to three um, feet. Uh, I just want to, this is something I'm going to get to later with my questions, but I just want to remind us that the reason so many students are not being able to say yes to coming back to in person is because the schedule is so untenable for working class um, and socioeconomically disadvantaged students um, because there is a whole class of Sacramentans who uh, are working through Zoom and can afford to pick up their kids at noon but the majority of our students don't have situations where that's easy or possible um, and so uh, I think that's a much more important disparity for us to say than you know, the health authorities were not just looking at white students when they said three feet, right? This is for every student. There's no biological difference with the virus. Um, we need to understand these communities, but uh, bringing up equity performatively like this to stop kids from actually getting in-person class, um, it's offensive, honestly. Um, in addition, uh, I just, I want us to have a discussion about virtual academy, but I do want us to have a thoughtful and measured, not you know, we need this now. We need to sort of think through, um, you know, Natomas uh, has been very gung-ho about having a virtual academy, but it, they've only been able to sign up a little bit over 50 students. They're having trouble actually getting families to enroll. Um, and so I do think we need to be a little bit more measured with regard to that. Um, in addition, uh, you know, we are all wearing masks in this room right now. We are wearing plex. We have plexiglass between us. We are spaced six feet apart, but all of us are fully vaccinated. Um, and so we're wearing this because the rules are asking us to. Um, and that's fine. I do think that I appeal to our public health authorities to get us on track to rules, maybe not specifically with masking, but with regards to other things. Surface transmission, it's become very disruptive in classrooms where you can't touch anything or where a student, if they forget their borrowed Chromebook at home, they can't grab another one because they're not allowed to touch shared items. Uh, even though we know and have known for over a year, according to the WHO, that surface transmission is not a concern with uh, COVID-19. In addition, the plexiglass, um, we know from November 9th, the CDC and earlier um, studies in the Lancet that 
uh, the virus is primarily aerosol transmission and not droplet. And so what plexiglass does is actually makes it harder for the air to move around. Um, and so in certain cases, you're putting kids at more risk. Uh, and I'm glad we're not putting those on desks. Um, but th those are some of the things where I feel like I want to appeal to our local county department of public health, our state department of public health to bring us on track with stuff that we've known for a while. Let's get these rules on track so that we can be even safer. Um, uh, for the rest of the pandemic. Uh, and then to move on to my question, Miss um, Bieta, uh, you know, we started this presentation with a important quote from the CDE, which is that an LEA with more than sufficient space, staffing, and hygienic supplies, uh, dot, 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 should be offering full day and full week in-person instruction for all of its students. And I know we're doing, or we're pursuing uh, options to sort of uh, expand from two days to four days, uh, which is closer to full week. But why, what are we doing to get closer to full day? Why are we not um, expanding those three hours to six hours on one day? You know, getting to six from getting from six to twelve in that other way. I don't know if if superintendent or another member of our negotiations team would want to be able to speak to that because that's our intent and that's what we need to be able to do. Um, so I don't know if there's somebody else that would have more expertise on why we're not doing that with immediacy. Sure, um, it's a good question, uh, student board member Sheikh. I will give you my interpretation of an answer and then allow legal counsel to provide uh, their own perspective, but. Um, the simple answer is that that is uh, not what was agreed to when we signed the MOU. We would have to uh, renegotiate the MOU uh, because it would change uh, the uh, hours um, that were agreed upon uh, when we signed that MOU. Uh, so it would require us to renegotiate the MOU. Right. So just to get to complete care, the meet and confer language is only on the physical distancing area. And so that's why Correct. it's easier to pursue that route. Correct. Got it. Um, and so um, I know some of the board statement addressed this, but we hear a lot of public commenters saying, disregard the MOU, disregard the MOU. I would love for the superintendent or legal counsel, I know Raul is not here, but um, legal counsel to address sort of why we can't do that and what the ramifications might be were we to disregard an MOU that we reached uh, post-negotiation? Well, um, I, I want to be very cautious about um, addressing the question um, because it is uh, a question that uh, involves legal advice, uh, uh, student board member Sheikh. Uh, there are certainly alternatives and options available uh, that uh, have been uh pursued in the past uh in terms of for example unilateral implementation that does come with uh uh, uh potential challenges as you know uh, in the form of grievances and unfair labor practice charges that are then um uh, that then require of course resources for us to address um uh, uh and so it's not uh, a decision that we take lightly of course uh or that i take lightly as 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 your superintendent um uh, and so i'll kind of leave it at that got it okay uh that's all for me thank you Member Vela, did you have your sign up? So um, I have a lot to say about this, and I've said it many times uh, at this in this area, um, in conversations, telephone calls. Um, I'm pretty livid about this, and I want to go back to one of the comments that um, somebody had said. I'm just a mom. You're not just a mom. You're an advocate. You're a voice. You deserve to be heard. Everybody in our co our community, mother, father, grandparent, deserves to be heard. So you're not just a mom. I'm just a mom, but I'm here for the right reasons of taking care of our kids and always putting them first. Um, I will say that the ability inability to combine cohorts and getting us all back safely is just unfair. And I personally think it's downright criminal. Um, it's not what we're here to do. It's embarrassing. Um, we're here to serve our families and to all of our children in our district. That's what we were elected to do. Um, I'm not worried if we have one day a week and one week or four weeks left of school. Um, our kids need to be back in their classroom with their teachers, with uh, their principals, with their friends. They need to be learning together. Um, I see it when I visit the schools. Um, 
watching those children play together, get not necessarily play together, but see each other in line and uh, stand together in line. And, you know, they go through the fence and they do all the process. It's so wonderful to see. And there, it is loud. Watching that movie noise brought me to tears because I want to hear that noise. And I guarantee a lot of families and a lot of, a lot of teachers and definitely kids want to hear the noise. They deserve that. Um, Oh, like I said, I'm not I'm not worried if we have one week or four weeks left or kids need to be back. Um, I'm livid with the six feet guideline that we're still at. I said it at every board meeting and I'll keep saying it uh, that we keep discussing this. Uh, I take this seat very seriously. We need to take action. It makes me obviously incredibly angry and incredibly emotional because we have to do better here, folks. Our kids deserve that. They're going to look back on this year and they're going to look at the folks who were in the room and making the decisions and they won't forget. And I want to make sure that we are doing the right thing for our families so they will remember that we constantly spoke up and we are doing what we can in these seats for our families. Um, with that, I want to say, I want to ask a question, Superintendent. Uh, negotiating for fall is obviously high on my mind, and I want to make sure that we have an update at every board meeting on what that looks like and also a time frame because I'd like that these, some kind of negotiations wrapped up by the end of July because I'm not going to have what happened in August of last year to all of our families. That was chaotic and it was emotional and it was very tiring for all parties involved. So I want to make sure that uh, we get these negotiations wrapped up because I want to know what actually needs to be negotiated to go back to school five days a week, all of our students. And to me, it's not negotiable at this point. So if you could just let me know and then also report back on what we'd be looking at. Um, that's all I have to say, obviously. You know, I, I'm just a mom, but I'm also elected into the seat to do what's right for our community. So that's all I have to say. Well said. Member Garcia. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. Um, I wanted to touch on the issue of assessments, um, in particular, um, the iReady um, uh, assessment program, I don't know what to call it. Um, and I just wanted to get a little bit more information as to why that particular um, assessment was um, chosen as opposed to using a district um, uh, uh, developed assessment. And I just want to understand what the trade-offs are and um, so I can better understand the importance of um, not setting precedent in terms of continuing to use this particular assessment moving forward to monitor student um, progress um, and just as importantly, monitor um, the investments um, with, um, with the limited um, resources that we have. Thank you for that question, Member Garcia. I would say first and foremost, um, our first proposal to SCTA around assessments did include our um, assessments from our co common assessment portfolio that are aligned to the, um, the scope sequence pacing. And in the case of ELA are our embedded assessments that are part of our curriculum in in our primary or elementary grades. Um, we, we SCTA asked that we consider the iReady assessments and our curriculum and instruction team, who is, they are an amazing team. They went to work really researching because they acknowledged that they did not have depth of background with the iReady assessments. We have some of our schools, I think it was about 21, that were utilizing iReady programming and assessments, but not all. And they didn't have deep deep understanding, but they went to work and did some research and came back and said, these really will work for a one-time opportunity for us, not necessarily an ongoing opportunity. These assessments will give us information on our students where they're at. They don't necessarily, though, do what our common assessment portfolio does. And our team has done an incredible job of creating an assessment and then there's a period of time where we teach and then we assess again with our own assessments to learn, did the students acquire what they needed? Did our instruction work? Do we need to revise? 
And our whole assessment portfolio is designed around that. It's designed around assess, find out where kids have strengths, find out where their superpowers are, find out what else we need to do, go through a teaching cycle, and then assess again to find out what's working and not working, and then continuing through that cycle through the year. iReady is not necessarily going to do that for us. It's going to give us some information on a bank of standards and a bank of skills across the year. And that's good. And we need that. And we're also really grateful because we're going to have information this year also on our kindergartners, our first graders and our second graders, because those are not grade levels where we would typically be offering our standardized assessments. And we're grateful to have that. So for this year and this year only, we feel like the iReady assessment will work in lieu of our CASP or SBAC assessments. But as we move into our next cycle of assessments, we look forward to being able to come to an agreement and have assessments that are really going to help us with our assess and teach cycle, because that's really what we need to be doing to improve outcomes for kids. And I want the board to acknowledge and remember um, there was a pandemic in Sac City Unified regarding student learning before there was ever this pandemic. And we, we know that as our students come back, we're going to have to use multiple data points to help us to understand how we need to best serve our students. And iReady will give us some information to end our year, but we're not recommending that to continue in forward at this point in time. Member Garcia, if I can just mention, I know that uh, the board had an opportunity to review that MOU, and I wanna highlight that uh, that MOU is very clear in its language about this being a one-time agreement, non-precedent setting. I know that the board is also aware of uh, the uh, MOU that was signed in 2016 uh, regarding uh, assessments. Uh, and so we will continue to keep the board updated. I listened to President Pritchett's uh, statement uh, and there is incredible value that, um, that we see uh, and that I think uh, the board also uh, sees as we start coming back to the board with proposals for how we intend to invest resources. I know that the board takes very seriously uh, the the importance of being transparent about how our investments will tie back directly to student outcomes. And of course, the use of these assessments will help us better understand uh, where we need to make adjustments and improvements. But most important, uh, they're necessary for the purposes of responding accordingly based on uh, student needs uh, and interventions that are required. And so I hope that um, our board will stay committed uh, to uh, ensuring that uh, we uh, can extend uh, an agreement uh, and make sure that we have district-wide assessments, which is, um, uh, believe it or not, uh, this is uh, the first set of district-wide assessments that we will administer since 2016. And if you think about the number of years between uh, that academic year and and this academic year, uh, we're talking about a generation of students that we have not been able to understand how to appropriately intervene based on our ability to understand differences across the district um, on uh, academic performance of our students. And so uh, I'm hopeful that the board will stay committed to uh, ensuring that uh, we have a plan that allows us to communicate the value of of our work uh, across the district for all of our students. Um, yes, thank you. So again, I'm just very interested that we have the right set of assessments. Um, I think the ones that are developed internally are probably the best ones. Um, and um, we not only support the work of our um, internal experts, but also um, begin to build capacity internally um, in terms of uh, assessments. And then the importance um, and the requirement um, attached to all of these dollars that are coming into the district to make sure that we're monitoring student progress and, um, and making sure that we're making the investments that are necessary and that the investments that we are making are, are matching up with the, with the needs. And, um, and that we are seeing that across the district. So I just wanted to make sure that I um, followed up on that. And then um, just moving forward, 
um, I just wanted to um, thank all the um, the uh, the parents and, and everybody who wrote in their comments on this particular item, as well as those who made the time to call in. Um, and thank you for advocating uh, for um, and sharing your thoughts about uh, school reopening. I do want to say that I want to advocate on behalf of um, parents in my trustee area because they are the ones who are being left behind in the um, in, in moving in, in with collapsing of classrooms. In trustee area two, we don't have um, as many schools or classrooms that can't be collapsed because we're already operating at full capacity at six feet. And um, and I just wanna echo um, the, um, the, the comments from some of my colleagues that we're operating on antiquated science. And I want to know what is it that we must do to move forward with three feet? Because we are leaving behind students. We are not giving them access to, um, to be in a classroom for in-person instruction four days a week, just like we're giving access to other students. And I know that we are always looking for, um, for, uh, for proceeding in a way with an equity lens, and I fully support that. Um, you know, we need, must uh, meet the needs of, of of our students with the with the highest needs. Um, you know, per AB eighty six, but that's not equality. That's not equality for trustee area two. That's not equality for other sites and other trustee areas. So I want to know how do we move to three feet at those school sites where we cannot accommodate additional students because they're at full capacity with six feet. Well, what, what I would say, Member Garcia, is we have stated um, our position very clearly uh, from the moment that the board ratified the reopening MOU. Uh, we have sought to meet and confer uh, with our labor partners on this topic. Uh, we've not been able to make any advancement. Uh, so to answer your question, it would be a decision point for for uh, this body uh, to essentially move forward uh, with with a decision to uh, uh, start collapsing uh, uh, by way of reducing the distancing between six feet and three feet, uh, because you're absolutely right. And, and we should acknowledge that uh, at some of our school sites, uh, we are not able to bring back students uh, four days a week. And uh, many of our students are having to wait an entire week to come back to school. Uh, for those students, they will go through this entire academic year not having known uh, half of their peers in, in, in their own uh, classroom. And uh, that's the case for my, my own daughter, my youngest daughter. And, and, and I agree with you. I mean, it, it is something that, um, that, uh, that is not fair um, uh, in, in, in cases where we have uh, higher percentages of attendance for in-person instruction. So that's how I'd answer your question. It, uh, we've stated our position, we've stated uh, where we'd like to go, um, and it would uh, require us to make uh, a decision to move forward uh, uh, regardless or despite the fact that, uh, that the MOU uh, speaks to six feet uh, and we've done everything we can to have a discussion that gets us to um, serving more students by closing the distance uh, between our classrooms. Um, well, then, in my opinion, I think that's where we need to go. Thank you. Member Wu. My opinion also, as soon as you can, start moving toward collapsing that six feet down to, to less. And, um, when when do you think you can make a recommendation on the assessment? Uh, uh, member, would you not not an assessment on reducing the distancing, but the local comment? Okay, uh, in terms of those assessments, um, uh, we will uh, of course start the process of of administering uh, the current set of assessments that we've agreed to. Uh, we have requested uh, to engage with our labor partner uh, uh, in light of the MOU that was signed in 2016, the arbitration decision from last year as well. 
that uh, we begin to discuss uh, the schedule of assessments for the 21-22 school year. Uh, we uh, have sought to meet with them for uh, many months now. Uh, we'd be happy to schedule uh, some kind of workshop to give the board uh, more uh, information, a better understanding. Uh, Member Garcia raised the question of the difference between a set of common assessments that uh, might be available through, uh, for example, a commercial vendor versus those that are developed locally. Uh, we, uh, uh, CAO Bieta mentioned um, uh, our, our uh, amazing staff here uh, that work uh, diligently um, to 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 come up with some of those assessments and um, I, I'm reminded of not not using K-12 lingo but when uh, CAO Beta talks about embedded assessments uh, that's because those are part of the curriculum that one is teaching uh, and uh, I, I would say and argue that um, that that those are uh, as member Garcia mentioned, uh, very valuable. Uh, and that's why we offered, uh, those, uh, forms of assessments, uh, to, uh, our labor partner. Um, uh, those aren't the ones that we ended up with, uh, which is why it was important that we, uh, include language that this was, uh, an agreement for this administration only, uh, not precedent setting, uh, and that we uh, 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 continue to discuss the set of assessments for the 21-22 school year. So uh, I appreciate the, the statement from President Pritchett um, about that understanding from the board. And, and I know that our staff would be uh, very, in, very, very excited to sit with the board and, and, and have uh, a workshop uh, just on assessments in general. Member Morosky. Thank you. And yes, I agree. We need to we need to spend more time talking about and, and doing assessments uh, and stop the educational malpractice of of not having common district assessments. Um, on this issue, I wanted to to thank staff about um, just the hard work and the you know the effort of pulling pulling in more students as we can it's painstaking and just you know noting again the only reason we're doing this and having to do it in such awkward ways is that we're using this outdated standard um there's absolutely no reason to be excluding our kids from school at this point uh i feel like a broken record on this but it's it's crazy that to think that you know we need to justify like having our kids in school when there's no justification for excluding them at this point um i just i, I heard some just arguments tonight expressed that I, I found a little disturbing so i just wanted to highlight this before we just move on from this because i think it's important to to really think about what we're what we're saying and, and what kind of arguments we're making. I heard we need to plan for the fall and that's why we shouldn't be talking about this now. That's that's called a red herring. When you when you talk about, you know, uh, something that seems relevant, it's distracting from the actual it has nothing to do with implementing three feet and getting our kids back to school. Or it could be called a black and white fallacy. We can do this or that. We can't do both. That's absolutely wrong. We can do both. Okay. I heard that we're not like other districts, as if our children are uniquely undeserving of having a normal school. Is that how we're not like normal districts or other districts who are just as you know diverse and um, just have have similar uh, ra you know racial and economic mixes as us? Um, I heard that racial equity and, and health disparities means that we need to keep excluding children. Um, from the classroom who want to be here in the classroom. Um, I just, you know, I just think it's, it seems like a justification of trying to keep something in place that's totally, uh, totally unjustified. So, I mean, we keep on talking about learning loss and mitigating it while we're continuing to impose it um, by keeping our kids out of school. So I just, uh, it makes me angry. I'm echoing the 
comments of some of my colleagues. Um, and we just, we need to stop the insanity here. And so educate our children. Thank you, Mom, Member Murawski. All right. Um, with for the sake of time, I just have one really quick question, and and uh, it's a question that's been asked of me probably over the last week. It's about the school calendar um, and the adoption of the school calendar. Can you give us an update of that? Uh, yes, we can, and I'll see if uh, our staff can be more specific. Um, we will. Um, uh, 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 send something to the board related to that topic um, over the next few days, uh, Member Pritchett, um, because I do know that uh, this is a topic that year in and year out uh, is one that's mentioned. Parents want to know with greater certainty uh, what the next year's calendar is going to look like. As you know, we have uh, tried for as long as I've been your superintendent uh, to shift that calendar. Um, uh, primarily uh, based on the fact that, and, and we have described it on many occasions, uh, our students are still in session uh, for, uh, much longer uh, than most students in the region. Uh, it impacts their ability to attend uh, summer programming um, all the way up to community college. Uh, where many of our students, I think, could benefit uh, from taking summer courses at a community college. Our students are still in session. Uh, we know that uh, it has impacted their ability to gain uh, employment opportunities as well, um, because summer programs or summer, summer uh, employment opportunities are exhausted by the time our students uh, finish their school year. Uh, we've talked about the impact that it's had uh, in the number of instructional days for uh, AP exams, for example. Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, um, maybe student board member Shay can speak to this issue. I know it happened to my daughter. Uh, you 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 don't end the semester until after uh, winter break as well, um, and so uh, it, it there's a lot of reasons why I think it would be. Uh, 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 more preferred to end the academic uh, the, the semester before the winter break uh, uh, or, or at the at the time that winter break starts. Um, so we will provide an update uh, to the board and to our community over the next few days. Okay, perfect. Well, um, I just wanted to say thank you to staff for this presentation and um, thanks to Ms. Beata for um, making us most of us cry up here. That video is just um, touching and I have to say that uh, it, you know, it just kind of brought back the emotion of, you know, over the last couple of weeks going on to school campuses, I felt overcome with emotion from the sounds <laughs> of the school and seeing the kids engaged. And I've always said that, you know, we as board members, you know, we sit up here, we, you know, we, we do our, our thing, but then when we get frustrated, what I do is I go to a school site and I get energized and it's a reminder of why I do what I do. Right. Um, and during COVID, we didn't have that. So, you know, stepping onto a, um, a campus for the first time, I, I was literally like, in tears for you know, the first five minutes of, of being there, just seeing the kids fully engaged. So thank you for that reminder once again. Uh, this is an informational item, so we will bring this back again. Thank you so much. And thank you to our community for your comments. Um, item 10.0, board workshop, strategic plan and other initiatives. 10.1, approve the 2021 third interim financial report and BICMAT update. Ms. Ramos. And, and President Bridget, if I can just say before people start logging off, uh, I know that uh, the previous item was uh, important for our community, but uh, I would encourage you to stay on for this presentation. It really um, reflects the two primary responsibilities that we have uh, as a governing body, uh, the academic programming uh, for our students and uh, the fiscal uh, responsibilities that we have. And so these are back-to-back -back items that reflect uh, those primary responsibilities. So uh, uh, I hope that uh, members of our community can stay on for this presentation as well. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. If we could uh, please start the, the uh, presentation, the slides. Order. Now she's snake wrangler. Can I give you a snowy? Thank you, lady, so much. We'll give her a round of applause for taking care of that. That's great. Think about what you put in that blank a couple minutes ago. Great teachers, what? 
All right, thank you. I imagine that not too many of us in this room wrote down that oh, this, great teachers I think we're having the smartest person technical difficulty. Yeah, sounds like everything was Okay, thank you. All right, good evening, uh, President Pritchett, uh, board members, superintendent, and members of the public. Uh, tonight, we will be presenting to you the 20 2021 third interim uh, budget financial report. And uh, with us presenting with me tonight will be uh, some staff members uh, Adrian Vargas, our assistant superintendent of business services, uh, Jesse Castillo, our director of accounting services, and then we have a special guest with us, uh, Leilani Aguinaldo from. Uh, School Services Director of Governmental Relations. Uh, she will be giving us an update on the May revise. So um, thank you. So next slide. The agenda for tonight is going over the reporting requirements and the district's fiscal status, and then the uh, changes since second interim. And then we'll spend a little bit of time on the multi-year projections and uh, review the budget calendar, and then give you an update on the uh, FICMAT uh, matrix. Um, and then just some very high level information on our CARES funds. And then we'll dive into the May revise and then conclude with uh, the summary and then an opportunity for questions. Next slide, please. Um, these are the ed codes that drive the financial reporting requirements for school districts. The first one speaks to the two uh, reporting periods that all districts are, are bound by. Um, there is the first interim, which covers the period through October 31st, the actuals, and then projects the remaining year. And then there's the second interim that covers the actual period through January 31st, and then, of course, projects through the remaining year. And then, um, then the, the following ed code speaks to whether uh, a district can meet its uh, financial obligations uh, for the current budget year and the two subsequent years, and the board takes actions to certify that. So the action can be either a positive, negative, or qualified. And then those districts, the final ed code here, that um, receive a negative certification are required to file a third uh, financial report as of April 30th. And I just want to pause here a little bit and just explain um, the third interim. Um, although the board will be approving um, or not this uh, financial report this evening, there is not a certification that's uh, attached to uh, the third interim financial report. Um, the certification is just attached to the first two financial reports, the first interim and the second interim. Um, the next reporting cycle will be um, the where we certify one of our interims will be first interim for the coming year. And that will not be presented to the board until December, just like we always do covering that for that uh, first interim report through October 31st. So I just wanted to clarify that because I know there's a little bit of um, confusion and sometimes some questions about you know, how, what happens with third interim as far as cert certification is concerned? Um, are we expecting a negative, positive, or qualified? And none of those, because it, it is not a report that is certified in that same manner. So just for clarity purposes. Um, next slide, please. And then, um, uh, and just some information on the district's fiscal status. Um, as we all know, the district's uh, 2021 uh, revised adopted budget was disapproved by SCOE. Um, because again, for the um, same reasons that I, we had a, uh, we were projecting at that time that uh, the 22, uh, 23 um, unrestricted general fund would end with a negative ending balance and we continue to deficit spend. Um, and the district is still continuing to um, deficit spend um, in our projections that you'll see for 21, 22 and 22, 23. You see that our cash flow continues to diminish and that is because we're deficit spending and uh, and we're still in need of a, a fiscal recovery plan to address the deficit completely and so until such time um, the sacramento county office of education's fiscal advisor will remain assigned to the district and so we will remain under a stay and rescind authority um, 
And the new budget that just to, to um, again, um, just share with the community and the, the board that the district just in a matter of weeks will be presenting the new uh, budget for the 21-22 uh, fiscal year with the two out years, of course. And this will be approved by our board in June. Um, and then by August 15th, the uh, Sacramento County Office of Education uh, will either approve, disapprove, or conditionally approve that budget. Um, and yet what you'll see in the budget presentation that's coming up next month is that um, the multi-year projections will illustrate that the district continues to deficit spend in the uh, two out years, and that um, we will also be modeling a second multi-year projection just to show you um, what our regular operating deficit looks like by removing all those one-time um, sources. Because we know right now our budget looks um, a little odd with, you know, all of these one-time funding sources that have come our way, like many other districts, to mitigate the impact of um, COVID. And so it is um, difficult to really see, you know, what the district's regular operating budget looks like with all of that resource, uh, those resource funds and those additional expenses um, built into our budget. So we'll be showing you both so you can um, easily and the public can easily see the difference between the two. Um, next slide, please. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Adrian Vargas. Okay, thank you, Rose. Um, so I'm going to take you through um, a couple of slides talking about the changes of the third interim report uh, compared to the second interim. Overall, our revenues increased by 12.3 million, and that's primarily due to budgeting on the restricted side, um, the in-person instruction grant, approximately of 11.7 million. Uh, we also saw an increase overall of over $11 million in um, expenditures. And again, that's primarily due to budgeting that uh, in-person instruction grant, but also um, to budget for the salaries and benefits associated with the MOUs that we signed with our labor partners. And then also just the, um, increase in services and operating costs um, related to COVID purchases. Um, on the unrestricted side, we saw a decrease of $6 million, and I'll talk about that in subsequent slides. Um, we are projecting our cash flow to be positive through June of 2021. Um, and in our revised multi-year projections, we will show that we are still meeting uh, or we are will meet the required 2% reserve through 22-23. However, as Rose mentioned, we are still deficit spending and our projected uh, deficit spend in that third year out is $27.5 million. Next slide, please. And then here is just a snapshot of the general fund um, from the third interim budget uh, compared to the second interim budget that was presented in March. Um, and as you can see, overall, uh, the total uh, net increase um, went up by a little over $900,000. Uh, next slide, please. And then here are the uh, changes um, from second interim. And as you can see, uh, overall from the um, unrestricted and restricted, uh, you see that $907,000 uh, increase in the um, surplus. Uh, when you look at both um, combined budgets and um, but overall as i talked about earlier you could see on the unrestricted side there's a total savings of approximately six million uh, in expenditures on the restricted column you do see an increase of roughly 12.2 million um, in uh, revenues and then an increase of about 17.5 million um, in expenditures Next slide, please. And so in talking about the uh, changes um, uh, on the unrestricted revenues, uh, really what we saw was just a small increase in our local revenues of about 78,000. Um, our LCFF revenue calculations uh, remain the same. Um, it's based off the second interim uh, enrollment projections um, or basically our CalPADS numbers that we received in October of this year. And then just as a reminder, um, we are being funded off the 1920 uh, ADA uh, for the current 2021 year. So th that did not change. Next slide, please. 
And then moving on to the unrestricted expenditures, um, we saw a decrease in salary and benefits of approximately $3.9 million. And this is primarily due to um, seeing more savings in our substitute budgets, our extra duty budgets. Um, and then of course, uh, we still have vacancies that um, we are seeing savings from. Also, um, we uh, saw a decrease in our supplies and services of roughly one and a half million dollars. Um, and then we had some small um, increase in our capital outlay. Um, and then we had a decrease of 686,000 in uh, indirect costs. Next slide, please. And then on the um, restricted side of the budget, um, we are seeing an increase in our federal revenues of roughly uh, 282,000. Uh, the state revenue is the largest um, increase, which is where the in-person instruction grant um, is, is located. And that was uh, at 11.9 million. And then again, we saw a small increase in our local revenues uh, of 23,000, primarily due to our one-time donation funds. Next slide, please. And then um, the slide basically reviews the um, restricted expenditures and the changes from um, second interim to third interim. And we were looking at an increase of about 9.6 million uh, in our salaries and benefits. And again, that's adjustments to pay out our stipends related to the MOUs. Uh, we saw an increase in supplies and services of 6 million. Um, and basically that's our one-time budget adjustments um, covering uh, COVID-related purchases, um, as well as budgeting um, that full $11.7 million in our in-person instruction grant. Um, and then we had some adjustments made um, for our capital outlay as well. And the next slide, please. And then moving on to our multi-year projection assumptions, um, in this third interim report, we are using um, the January governor's proposal, uh, COLAs, um, which was projected at that time at 3.84% for the 21-22 year and 1.28% in the 22-23 year. Um, we, again, this is just based off the January proposal. There was a May revise, and then Rose will talk about that um, when we get to that section. Um, so, of course, those COLAs assumptions will change. Um, but in regards to our enrollment, uh, prior to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, our enrollment was projecting to go decline by approximately 0.5% or 200 students each year. And just as a reminder of how we built our uh, multi-year projections in the second interim, and they, um, they are included in this report as well, uh, we are projecting um, our our decline at roughly um, well we're we're projecting that we will recover about fourteen hundred students or seven hundred of the fourteen hundred students that we saw um, decline from our nineteen twenty year to the current year of twenty twenty one so that was roughly a three and a half percent decline that we saw from last year to this year. Um, but with the um, pre-registration numbers and the decision insight projections uh, that we received in January, um, we're hopeful that we will recover about 50% of those 1,400 students. Um, and so those are the projections for 21-22. Um, and then in 22-23, we're projecting a 1% decline and then um, another 1% decline for the 23-24 year. And then on the restricted revenue side, um, in both out years, we're removing the one-time COVID relief funds and expiring uh, grants like SIG and then carryover related to our title programs. And then just of note, when it comes to our COVID funds, um, that was roughly $50 million in federal revenues and about $15 million in state COVID funds that are being removed in the out years. Next slide, please. 
And then on the expenditure changes, we're projecting an uh, increase in step and column of about two million each year for certificated and 400,000 for classified. Um, we're adjusting uh, for STRS and PERS increases, um, which total about 2.1 million in 21-22 and 3 million in 22-23. Um, we did get our health rates uh, for the upcoming year for our certificated group. And so we are projecting that at a flat percentage. And um, we are still projecting an 8.5% increase for classified, uh, which is projecting out at about a, a million and a half increase for 21 22. And then in the 22 23 year, we're uh, projecting an 8% increase, which equates to about 4.7 million. Also, um, we are seeing an increase in our unemployment insurance, uh, where it's going from a 0.005% uh, rate to a 1.23% rate. Uh, so with that increase, we're projecting about $3 million uh, in, in increases uh, in our budget in the multi-year. And then um, in our multi-year projection, we are adjusting our books and supplies in both years to remove one-time expenditures um, like textbooks, uh, expenditures related to our COVID-19 funding, and then um, expenditures related to our expiring resources. And so a majority of those uh, expenditure removals um, are coming on our restricted side uh, of the budget. And um, of that amount, it's roughly about 32 and a half million um, in 22, 21, 22, and another 15 million in 22, 23. And then finally, we, we are showing our increases in special ed, um, which are projecting over the two years of roughly uh, $18 million. Next slide, please. And then um, finally, with, with all, those adjustment, all those adjustments, um, this is a snapshot of what the multi-year projection looks like from 2021 to uh, 2223. And as you can see, um, we are projecting a, uh, an excess in the current year, but we are still deficit spending at 19.3 million in 21-22 and 27.5 million in 22-23. Um, so as Rose mentioned, um, we still need to eliminate uh, $27.5 million in deficit spending in our third year out. So with that, I will pass it on to Jesse Castillo, and he will take you through cash flow. Thank you, Adrian. Good evening, President Pritchett, members of the board, and Superintendent Aguilar. Uh, if you could go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this slide is a picture of our multi-year cash flow projection. As you can see in the current year, um, relatively healthy cash flow balance. But as we look at the two subsequent years, uh, you can see that it starts to, to diminish rather rapidly. And that is due to the ongoing deficit spend that Rose and Adrian mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, so it just gives you an, an idea of how that impacts our cash flow as well. Next slide, please. This slide is a comparison of our first interim cash flow projections versus our second interim and where we are today with our third interim. As you can see, there's a significant change from first interim to second interim, and there are two primary factors uh, that impacted that. The first being that we were granted 100% deferral exemptions for the months of April and May, which was about $40 million improvement in our cash flow, and also about $40 million in one-time savings from, COVID, from the COVID-19 pandemic that were identified at the second interim report as well. Um, and so that's how that has impacted and changed since second. And then for third interim, of course, the additional savings that were identified as each one spoke to earlier. Next slide, please. This is the Government Finance Officers Association's recommendation of carrying a reserve of 17%, which is about two months payroll or $75 million worth for our district. Um, another way to look at that as well is if you were to combine all of our expenses um, for one month, it would equate to about $50 million or, or two weeks would be $25 million. Um, so important to have healthy reserves. Next slide, please. <coughs> This is just a brief overview of our budget calendar and timeline. Uh, we're currently in May for the third interim report with the next presentation being our adopted budget in June. And of course, we'll be bringing an updated calendar at that time. Next slide, please. 
This is an overview of the FICBAT fiscal health risk analysis that was conducted back in October of 2018. Um, in this analysis, FICMAT identified 60 deficiencies as well as recommended uh, corrective actions. So far, we've completed 30 of those and have 30 remaining. We do not have any updates since the second interim, but district staff continues to work towards implementing these corrective actions. Uh, the next update will be presented with our 2021 unaudited, unaudited actuals, and the full report is also available on our district website. And we're also working uh, on an updated format for that report as well, so it's easier for our stakeholders and community members uh, to interpret and track our progress. Next slide, please. This is an overview of our various COVID funding sources, with the latest being that from AB 86. Uh, the first is our Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant, and the next being the In-Person Instruction Grant. Um, of note for the In-Person Instruction Grant, that is still an estimated allocation. Uh, the reason being there's a few factors that flow into how that's calculated. Um, we will have our final allocation um, in August. And we also have a board workshop, board workshop excuse me, scheduled for early June 2021 on our COVID-19 funding sources. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Leilani from School Services to prevent, present on uh, the May revise. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Um, again, this is Leilani Aguinaldo on behalf of School Services of California here to give a very quick overview about the May revision. Um, so for just a quick overview also of the budget process, so every year in January, the governor is required to unveil his proposal for the state budget for the following fiscal year. Um, I was here in January and gave you that overview. And then there's um, legislative hearings um, as they you know, uh, evaluate the governor's proposal. And where we are today is at the May revision. Um, by law, the governor is required to update the state budget that he has proposed for the state um, and that's so that he can um, update the, the budget proposal with more updated nov um, revenue numbers, et cetera. And so that's the, that's the budget proposal that the governor uh, released last Friday. And then quick next steps is there will be more legislative hearings to consider the proposals that are now in the, in the May revision. Um, and all of that takes place before the legislature is required by statute to adopt the budget by June 15, and then the governor would sign it into law by June 30, so that it would take effect on July 1st, the beginning of the next fiscal year. So we've come a long way from a year ago. It was a year ago where the state was forecasting a $54 billion deficit, and it's for that reason one of the primary impacts um, for schools of that $54 billion deficit that was projected a year ago is we had to contend with almost $13 billion of of deferrals and, and Jesse just explained how, you know, we were able to get a waiver for some of the few months of the deferrals that were in effect for the current fiscal year. Well, fast forward to now and the May revision that the governor unveiled just last Friday includes $17.7 billion more in Prop 9, Proposition 98 funds compared to the governor's proposal that he released in January. So in total, what this means for Proposition 98 funding, and this is the minimum amount of funding that the state is required to provide to K-14 education, well, the level that's included in the May revision uh, for 21-22 is 93.7 billion. That's a lot of money. Um, and that's a historic high for Proposition 98 levels. We've never had it this high before historically. Um, included in that amount, that $93.7 billion that the governor has proposed, he is required to deposit $4.6 billion into the public school system stabilization account, which is also known as the, um, the public school rainy day fund. And what this means um, as well is because of this level, the $4.6 billion that the state is required to deposit into the state rainy day fund, this does trigger a statutory cap on local reserves, which is projected to take place um, under current funding levels in the 22-23 fiscal year. We do recommend at school services that districts proceed with extreme caution, um, even though there is this anticipation of, a, of the statutory cap on local reserves being triggered in 22-23. This is a little bit of unfortunate news and, and unfortunate that we have to brace ourselves for this um, because, as Jesse mentioned just a few slides ago, there is that recommendation um, that for prudent budgeting, you know, they recommend a, uh, a reserve level of 17%. And then just for, um, for context, um, the latest state, the latest numbers we have, the state average for unified school districts um, of local reserves is 18.82%. 
um, and the reason for districts um, trying to have as healthy reserves as they can is because there's lots of things that we uh, that are unanticipated that factor into local school district budgets, right? I mean, we spent a lot of time here talking about the declining enrollment that Sac City Unified is contending with, um, step and column increases in expenses um, for salary costs for our employees, um, stirs and purrs increases, increases in, in the unemployment insurance rate. That was something that that Jesse just detailed as well, not to mention that there is still a lingering deferral. So these are all reasons um, for districts like Sac City Unified to absolutely try to have as healthy a reserve as they can at the local level. Um, with all of this, um, the remaining deferral balance that is included in the May revision that the governor has not yet proposed to eliminate all of the deferrals, he does leave a balance of $2.6 billion. Um, and what this means at the local level is that all of our June apportionment will be deferred until July. So there is still that lingering um, deferral there. Um, one of the things to note is that the governor does not include dedicated funding to uh, mitigate the impact of the STRS and PERS employer rate increases. We are still projecting a steep increase in the employer rate um, in, starting in 21-22. Uh, it's an increase of about 1% compared to the current level that we're at in 2021. And then in 22-23, that level, the STRS employer rate could increase to as high as 20%, 20.1% um, actually, which is a pretty drastic increase compared to the 16.92%, um, which is what is uh, we're projecting for 21-22. Um, next slide, please. Um, that last bullet talks about the special education funding increase. And the reason for that increase in special education funding is because of this compounded COLA that's summarized here on this chart. Um, there, it, it is a 4.05% compounded COLA that's being applied to our special education base rates. So this is gonna be a significant help for a district like Sac City Unified, which still contributes a significant amount of general fund resources for special education related expenses. Um, local, the local control funding formula, which forms the bulk of most districts general fund revenues, um, the state is chipping in 5.07%, which is a, what we're calling a mega COLA, um, because it's considerably greater than the statutory COLA of 1.70%, which is what will apply to most categorical programs. Um, the way that the state got to the 4.05 compounded COLA is they combined the statutory COLA for one point of 1.7%. With the COLA that we would have gotten last or in the current year, um, but we were flat funded because of the projected budget deficit. So that's how they got to the 4.05% compounded COLA, which is supplying the special education. But in addition to all of that, the governor is proposing an additional 1% um, COLA to go into LCFF via ongoing funding. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, there is no dedicated funding for the STRS and PERS employer rate increases or for the unemployment insurance rate. But what they point to is we're providing you more money, more ongoing money through the local control funding formula, which will help mitigate those employer operational increases um, that we're having to contend with. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide I have with, for you today. As I said, this is a very quick overview, but very happy to answer any questions what you, that you may have. So what we've done here, there's a lot of money um, for K-12 education in this budget that the governor has proposed, proposed last week. So here I've summarized um, some of the significant investments that are included um, in the May revision. The first of those is $1.1 billion, which would take the form of a concentration grant augmentation. So the way this plays out is for concentration grant districts like um, Sac City Unified, that means that we have a proportion of foster youth, English language learners, and low-income students, which is greater than 55%. Um, and because we meet that threshold um, with a significant number of students that, are, that have um, greater needs, then we receive a, under current law, a 50% augmentation to the base grant for, for those students that are above the 55% threshold. While this $1.1 billion would manifest itself in increasing that concentration grant augmentation from 50% to 65%. However, there are strings attached with this additional money that would come to a district like Sac City Unified. And there is a requirement that those additional funds that come through the concentration grant, that we would be required to hire new staff in order to reduce our adult to student ratios in at our school sites. 
The 2.6 billion for the targeted intervention grant, this is designed to be a supplement to the expanded learning opportunities grant, um, which is something we're already um, able to count on. But this 2.6 billion is a new proposal and it again, also like the expanded learning opportunities grant that was part of AB 86. This would be required to be used for things like accelerated learning, extending instructional time, et cetera. Um, $2 billion for in-person instruction, health and safety grant, also designed to supplement the in-person instruction grant that we're getting as part of AB 86, but this is also a new proposal. And again, it would go to other health and safety expenses that are related to in-person instruction, like PPE, um, cleaning, et cetera, things like that. The expanded learning time proposal, this would put more money towards, again, concentration grant districts. And again, strings attached, there would be a requirement that school districts that receive this money um, provide before and after school care so that um, all elementary school students in the district would receive nine hours at school between their instructional time, the before school care, after school care, a student would have access, an elementary school student would have access to in total nine hours at school. So I would think of it as um, like wraparound services um, to help students and their families beyond the instructional day. Um, community schools, the governor increases the proposal for community schools to $3 billion. This would be distributed via grants, uh, competitive grants that districts would apply for. In aggregate, he proposes $3.3 billion to help with the teacher pipeline. So this $3.3 billion is divvied up to, into different, um, different smaller proposals that are focused on um, the teacher type pipeline. So some of these, for example, are for professional development, teacher residency programs, uh, waivers for costs associated with credentialing, so things like that. But in total, it's $3.3 billion. One of the more ambitious proposals included um, in the governor's May revision is to expand transitional kindergarten to be universal for all four-year-olds in the state. There is a slightly delayed implementation. He proposes that this would, implementation would start in the 22-23 school year, and then full implementation would be in 24-25. So this would be in line, but it's in more a more expedited timeline than Assembly Bill 22. Um, which is legislation that Sac City Unified actually supports. AB 22 has a more protracted timeline of 10 years for implementation. The governor's proposal would definitely speed this up. So we would be required to offer TK to all four-year-olds um, by the 24-25 school year. In addition to that, the governor proposes um, to reduce the, the ratios for our students in TK, and he, he provides more money for that. Um, and then finally, there is money um, for school nutrition to help um, provide access to universal meals for all our students. So again, I know that was a lot to throw at you. Happy to answer questions um, at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'll turn it back to Rose and her team and they'll talk through how this translates for Sac City Unified. Thank you, Leilani. Next slide, please. So very briefly, um, what does the May revise uh, mean for Sac City? And what we looked at was, of course, the proposed COLAs, because those were the most significant, and we wanted to quickly see what um, that impact would possibly be if those did, you know, carry all the way through at these amounts um, through to the enacted state budget. So the LCFF COLA at 5.07% would generate about $5 million uh, on ongoing dollars for the district. The special ed COLA 4.05% uh, would generate about a million dollars. So um, it's important to note that the third interim, of course, excludes those two uh, pieces of information. But I do have a slide to model these numbers through our multi-year projections so you can see the impact. Um, also, third interim excludes our actual balances because, of course, we won't know those balances until our books are closed over the summer. And we will present those numbers to you in September. And then we also have excluded the expanded learning opportunity grant because we have yet to um, submit that application and uh, get and we first have to get that that uh, plan approved by our board, which is coming up in uh, next week's meeting. And then we've also excluded the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 additional federal relief funds um, because we're not yet um, yet uh, planning to spend the ESSER 2 funds. And then the ESSER 3 funds, we don't have a final allocation nor do we have what's called is a, a resource code in order for us to put it into our budget. 
So that information should be available for us so that we can include it in our um, budget that we will be presenting to you in June. Um, next slide, please. And so here um, is the, uh, the COLAs modeled in our multi-year projections. And then what we've also done is we pr provided for you that third year, 23-24, uh, because you're going to be seeing that third year um, shortly in when we present to you the new year budget, the 21-22 budget. And so it was important for you to see how um, the district is not yet, um, although we have, we're getting this additional money, it is not sufficient enough to address our deficit 100%. It does reduce it significantly um, in, in the early years, but then um, as you see the cost of doing business and the cost of other cost increases with our, uh, associated with personnel um, do continue to outweigh those revenue increases. So let's look at 2122. Uh, we'll see that our deficit, although much smaller at 13 million, nonetheless, it's still there. And then we see that in 22-23, our deficit starts to climb back up to about 21 million. And then in 23-24, um, we see that even grow even a little larger to 35.6 million. And again, this is primarily due to our increasing personnel costs, um, mainly in our step and column and our stirs and purrs, and uh, of course, in our health benefits. And although um, it's just important to note that um, we did see a, a zero for our certificated group in our health, health um, uh, projected health expenses for this coming year, starting July 1, um, the reason for that is our carrier explained is because of uh, COVID and shelter in place, uh, many individuals just um, were home and they did, did not um, access um, healthcare as much. Um, so utilization rates dropped significantly but what we were also cautioned was don't get used to this because what's going to happen now as you know we're going back to a more normal environment is that more individuals are starting to access health care again and even at a higher rate because of all those missed appointments and missed services that they have to make up for. So we'll be bringing you more information on that um, and on what kinds of rate increases we can we can anticipate to see for, for this coming year. And so that's just an unknown that um, we'll have to make sure we brace ourselves and we plan accordingly for. Um, next slide, please. And so we're getting to the end of our presentation. And of course, we also have to um, share with you what risks and opportunities that we're hearing out there. Um, and we're not the only district and we just today uh, we were part of the uh, participate in the school services budget workshop and there were a few risks that were pointed out to districts, although you know the the state's budget is looking very promising and much better than a year ago. Um, some of you may recall that last year when we were having the same presentation, we were looking at a uh, deficit cola of roughly about 10% and that just you know would have been very devastating far more for Sac City. Uh, we were looking at deficits of closer to like 50 million, 60 million. And so this has certainly improved um, the outlook for Sac City. But nonetheless, um, we, we don't know that, you know, this is this, we know that this is not going to hold for Sac City for the for the future because of our ongoing structural deficit. And so with that, our first risk, of course, is the uncertainty. Uh, regarding the economy and the uh, state budget and the impact that that has for K-12 districts. And some of the funding that Leilani did share with you is one-time funding. It's not necessarily all ongoing. So we have to be, um, you know, we have to recognize that. And then the ongoing funding that's there, as Leilani shared with you, as uh, far as the concentration funding is concerned, it comes with strings attached. So that, assuming that the district would um, get some of those funds, that's not going to address our deficit because we have to spend it on new services and new um, uh, um, personnel for students. And then the other big risk that we're facing is that significant decline in enrollment. Although we're being held harmless as far as funding is concerned, we do know that this year we experienced a very big loss in enrollment. And so we've seen that some of those students are planning to come back in the fall. Um, and uh, But what we don't know is um, if that can that increase um, to restore us to the level that we were at pre-COVID, will that hold through that third year? So um, we have to make sure that we're prepared for that cliff, should we see that cliff and materialize, um, and, uh, and we have to plan for that decline in, in funding because we will not be held harmless in that third year. 
So just something that we'll be keeping our, our eye on very closely and sharing with you enrollment updates as we get closer to the start of school year. Now, the opportunities, of course, are the improved state budget and funding for K-12, um, the, and that we do recover our, our enrollment to the pre-COVID uh, trend, and that we achieve a fiscal recovery plan that's sufficient to restore the district's financial uh, stability, meaning to a point where we can eliminate this deficit and, uh, and start to get the district back on track again uh, financially. And I just wanted to comment that the budget, um, I know there's a lot of information that's shared that the budget is, you know, um, not really representative of the district because when you compare it to the actuals, the actuals, you know, have typically come back um, a lot better than what the budget has um, projected. But we have to remember that the budget is just a projection and it's based on information that is available to all school districts in California. We're not the only ones that are using these assumptions. These are assumptions that are provided to us from the Department of Finance, the um, school services, our county office of ed, and then our local indicators, our own enrollment, our own economy, things that are happening in our local economy. And so we use that information to build our budgets and we are required to show those two years out. We don't have the option of just being able to plan for one year. And, um, and sometimes those two year out years will show that the district is not um, in, in a financially stable um, status. And so, but various things happen throughout the year, just like the example I shared that last year, we were looking at a negative 10% COLA possibly, which would have been devastating. Now, fast forward one year, very short time period, that has completely been transformed to a positive 5% COLA. So just to share with you that this is what districts go through. It's kind of like a roller coaster. And we, and this is what we are we use to prepare these budgets and to share. It's not that we're coming up with these numbers just to present a very negative scenario for the district. It's just the reality of the information that, um, that we have out there. So we'll continue to, to update you. Um, the next uh, opportunity that we, you will have to see how, what this year is ending like um, although it won't be the final numbers, will be at the um, budget adoption when we have closer estimated actuals. And then, of course, over the summer and the coming weeks, we will be sharing with you our enrollment status. Are we recovering at a faster rate or are our students not um, coming back to our district um, at this lower rate, which will not be a positive thing for the district? So next slide, please. So in summary, just to recap, over the last few years, this district has implemented more than $50, $50 million in ongoing and one-time reductions in order to achieve fiscal solvency. And just recently, our board approved a, a fiscal recovery plan of $4.5 million. And in spite of all this, you know, we're still short. You know, based on third interim, we are still short by about $27.5 million in order to achieve complete fiscal solvency. And as I stated, our next reporting period will be in, in the adopted budget. And so at this point, um, this concludes our presentation and we are all now available for any questions before you move to, um, to take action on this information. Thank you, Rose. We have two live comments on this agenda item. The first one is David Fisher. There you go. Good evening. The Sac City third interim budget is a clear expression of the troubled fiscal oversight provided by the district administrators and the fiscal advisors from SCOE. Ironically, we're making such a declarative statement, not because the budget numbers are bad, because they're good. They're very good. In July, district staff presented a budget that projected a $75 million deficit. In the second interim, presented in March, that $75 million deficit has predict predictably become a $4.7 million surplus. With the third interim, the surplus has grown to $10.8 million. No doubt the surplus will continue to grow until the books close June 30th. This is not a new phenomenon. Since 2012-13, Sac City has run a surplus every single year except one. That's in 2017-18, and it's mostly because the district decided to pay out $6 million in vacation buyouts to high-paid administrators. Since then, the district's unresisted, unrestricted reserve fund has grown from $12.7 million to now over $100 million. Recently, CBO Ramos attended our bargaining. In her discussion with Ms. Ramos, she repeated the district's oft-repeated mantra, SCUSD continues to have a, quote, projected structural deficit. As we pointed out, and Ms. Ramos didn't re refute, Sac City does not, has not had a deficit, a structural deficit. 
a district that has op operated with surplus eight out of the last nine years, soon to be nine out of 10 years, cannot by definition have a structural deficit. But in word choice, Ms. Ramos was deliberate. The operative word here is projected, meaning the district predicts deficits, but actually never experiences them. Even tonight, I've heard things like our, we having a deficit, our deficit. What they're saying is they're predicted deficit. They just never come true or almost never. In September 2018, Sac City told the community it was months away from imminent fiscal insolvency. It ended that year with a surplus. 1920, Sac City projected a $12 million deficit, ended the year with a $23.6 million surplus. Fortunately, the additional resources now coming to the district through federal and state COVID Thank dollars. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Please wrap it up. Well, I'm on my last sentence. And the extraordinary investment in K-12 public education contained in the Governor's May Revise are such that even Sac City Minister won't be able to hide the truth. Let's get to work to uh, spend these valuable resources on students, not adding to an already huge reserve fund. Thank you. Next comment, Julie Del Agua. David was the final comment. Okay, I'm going to open this up for board discussion. Anyone? <laughs> Member Garcia? Guess I'll start. Um, just wanted to thank um, everyone who presented today. Um, this is uh, the Governor's May Revise is great for public education. Um, and um, I'm excited to um, talk about making investments as opposed to cuts. Um, but I do want to make sure that um, we don't lose sight of, um, of making the distinction about what our ongoing budget is versus our one-time, um, you know, um, funds. So, so I want to I, I want to ask that staff continue to provide us with two uh, multi-year uh, projections one that has uh, only ongoing um, you know sort uh, funding sources and one um, that has both ongoing and one-time funding um, sources just so that we can continue to keep um, I guess our eyes on the ball and making sure that that we're seeing the numbers for what they are um, I did want to talk a little bit about um, page 12 of the presentation, um, the enrollment. And um, I see that prior to COVID-19, um, the enrollment was projected to decline by approximately 0.5% or 200 students each year. And I know that this year is an anomaly. I mean, many districts across the state are seeing a huge decline in enrollment. So Sac City is not alone. I'm, I'm, um, I'm glad to hear that we are, um, you know, making great efforts to recover some of those students. Um, and I think the goal is, or at least the projection is to recover at least 50%. So that's about five, I mean, 700 students, because right now it's projected to be um, uh, 14, to have a declining enrollment of 1,400 students. But after that, the projection after next year includes a 1% um, decline. So I, I just wanted to understand why we're going pre-COVID is at 0.5% to, I guess, post-COVID at 1%. So can you unpack for that for me a little bit more? Sure, yeah, we can do that. Adrian, do you want me to take that one or? Sure, I, and I can fill in the gaps on that. Okay, um, the reason we're going up, up to a 1% member Garcia and members of the public is because um, we are we are being a little conservative in terms of being able to recover since we were only able to recover half of that 1400 which is about mm, 1.6 percent or so um, we were going to estimate that it was going to be only maybe about one percent of decline versus the half percent decline that we were seeing pre-covid 
However, we can modify that if those numbers increase over the next few months. What we did not want to do was overestimate recovering all those students um, in the event that that did not materialize. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a conservative approach um, to be modified absolutely should the students uh, materialize. Adrian, is there anything else I could want to add to that? Or? I would just conclude that we were looking at being more conservative and being more cautious um, and going with the 1% calculation. Okay, and but we'll continue to hear um, as those numbers change, correct? Yes. Okay, and then um, I do have another um, maybe question on... Well, the information was on page 13. Um, so the increase in health care cost is at 0%. I'm pleasantly um, surprised. And, um, and, and you know, this is good news for the district because I think um, the anticipation was that health care costs across the board were going to increase dramatically because of COVID. So I'm glad to hear that. I do recognize that um, this is very temporary and we're on borrowed time in terms of when we're going to see a huge increase, as you just mentioned, because um, people will start accessing their health care plans on a more regular basis moving forward. So this will increase um, in maybe the year after next. So we need to keep that in mind. And um, so um, that leads me to my second to last question. On page 25, uh, just, you know, again, appreciating just really um, presenting this information to us without the, um, the additional one-time funds so that we can better understand where the, the deficits are. And this is probably the lowest number I've seen, this projection 21-22, um, since I arrived in, in late 2018 the deficit being at $13 million, I just feel like that's something that can be addressed. Um, and um, we have been consistently uh, looking for ways to address our deficit with additional revenue, not only from the federal um, government, but also from the state. All this has to be ongoing, of course, otherwise we can't erase the deficit. But also, um, continuing to pursue negotiated savings. So I, I feel like we have a window of opportunity to finally achieve um, eliminating the deficit um, in a year when we have additional revenue to, so to soften some of the um, impacts, but also um, in a year where we will have um, a zero um, increase in healthcare costs. So I, I just think that we should zero in on um, on this opportunity that we have to have these conversations moving forward. And then lastly, I am very pleased um, to hear about um, universal TK. I've been talking about this issue for a few years. Um, even though um, the governor is proposing a very um, accelerated ramp up or implementation of universal TK, um, relative to AB 22, which the district is supporting. Um, I do want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the opportunity to plan to serve more um, kids and more four-year-olds in TK and really expand from the 10 classes that are currently being offered to more. Um, and I recognize that we may have some challenges with um, workforce in terms of hiring additional TK class I mean, teachers or preparing some of our own teachers to teach in those um, classrooms. But just wanted to make sure that that we're um, we're in planning mode because um, this is happening. So, and I'm very excited about that. And with that, um, I just wanted to thank staff for, um, for the information. Thank you, Member Garcia. Member Morosky. Thank you. Um, I'll be really quick. Um, thanks to staff for that, uh, that clear presentation, as always. Um, a couple of things on the, the thick mat. Um, I, I believe uh, it was mentioned. I think Jesse mentioned that you were going to work on an updated format that would be a little bit um, easier to understand and to process. And I know we've had a conversation about that, and I just wanted to appreciate um, your commitment to doing that. 
Um, I think it's, you know, it's just really critical as the last FICMAT report was not followed up on that we'd be um, really diligent and understanding what we still need to do. Um, and so I really just appreciate that and look forward to, you know, maybe at the next, uh, the next update, um, seeing that, that updated presentation, happy to uh, work with you on that or give you any feedback. Um, I fully support uh, Member Garcia's suggestion that we should have a multi-year um, projection that splits out one time and ongoing funds. I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, I also look forward to, I don't know if it's the same, um, the presentation of the information or a different one, but really, really being able to understand and display for our community all of the federal and state one-time dollars that that we're getting and where they're going and what they're being um, being spent on. So I think that those two things will, will be really important um, so that we understand um, also and our public understands all stakeholders um, what we what we actually can do um, over what period of time with what resources. Um, and I think that um, oh uh, one I guess one final thing I just because of because of the influx of one-time resources and maybe even more <laughs> that are uh, that might be approved in the in the final budget, I, I wanted to make sure that we understand that we'll have um, upcoming meetings to talk about these um, these items. So I don't know if staff can address um, what what plans are in place right now. Member Morowski, can you just repeat that real quickly, please? Oh, sure. Just uh, on the the all of the federal and state one time dollars that are coming in, I just wanted to be sure that um, we in our community can uh, know that we have that we want to have upcoming yes. meetings um, to discuss in more detail. Yes, um, yes absolutely. You had requested uh, Member Morowski the last time that we presented, um, I think, a couple of board meetings ago on uh, just some guiding principles that we were implementing related to those one-time um, uh, uh, funds that we would be receiving. Uh, we are planning at the moment, uh, and we'll certainly um, provide more details, um, that uh, we come back on June 3rd, Thursday, June 3rd. It is currently a non-board meeting week um, and have that longer discussion with the board uh, we anticipate that um, we will have some more specific recommendations uh, for the board uh, to consider uh, in terms of investments um, so that we can uh, meet the needs of our students. Uh, and so at this point, it, it would be a, a dedicated uh, board workshop uh, uh, discussion on that topic, uh, again, in response to uh, board members, including you, asking that it be, uh, it, it, that we allow for a longer period of time to have a discussion. Okay, wonderful. And we're going to discuss the, the state funding that we have to adopt a plan on for, um, for June 1st as well. Yeah, for, 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 for the uh, ELO proposal that is due by June 1st, uh, we will be recommending, uh, again, I, I, I understand that we've asked a, a great deal of our, of each of U.S. trustees, and it feels like we've been having uh, some sort of convening almost on a weekly basis. Uh, we are going to be asking that, um, that uh, our board consider coming back for a discussion on two topics, one of them which will be uh, the adoption of our ELO proposal <clears throat> uh, next Thursday, uh, May 27th. And of course, we will inform our public and, um, and, and ask uh, our members of our community to participate in that, along with a facilities master plan uh, update, if you will, as well. The board has asked for also a longer discussion on, on that topic. So. Um, uh, again, I apologize. I know that we are asking a lot of our trustees, um, and over the course of the next uh, month or so, uh, we probably will be seeing each other uh, once a week at least. We have a lot of work to do, and happily, it's because we have a lot of resources to plan for, so that's a good thing. Again, I appreciate the staff work that went into this. Thank you. Member Rhodes. Okay, so... 
Um, I'd like to echo what my colleagues have said today, and I'll keep this very short. Um, generally excited um, by what we have placed in front of us when it comes to what we get to look at and why we're meeting so much. Um, it's, it's exciting to say TK, Community Schools, Teacher Pipeline, uh, Mega Cola, LCFF, it's just... I don't, I don't, it's, I don't know if anybody else gets as excited about these things, um, but we're actually talking about like giving and not taking away, right? And, and I think it's great for our community to understand, yes, we still have a projected um, deficit uh, spending, um, but currently we're in a much better place than we were. And, and I think that as we have conversations going into next month, hopefully, fingers crossed, knock on wood, that we're even in a better place. And so I guess we'll end it on a positive note. This is all exciting. And I'm looking forward to all the meetings we can have to talk about how we uh, impact our community positively. That's it. Great, thank you. Um, since we're about an hour behind, a little over an hour behind on our board meeting, I won't ask any questions. I just uh, I want to encourage anybody that does not think that we've had a budget deficit or not have a budget deficit that you look at the last five independent audits that the district has had. Uh, okay, this is an action item tonight. So um, uh, with that, can I get a motion? Moved. All right, student preferential vote. Aye. Superintendent, roll call. Yes, Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morawski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips. Aye. All right. Looking forward to adding more, as Mr. <laughs> Member Rhodes had said. All right. Item 10.2, um, the local control accountability, accountability plan update. Hello, Mr. Harris. How are you? <laughs> and uh, Mr. Ramirez Fong is online with us. Good evening, board, President Pritchett, board members, and Superintendent Aguilar. My name is Vincent Harris. I'm the Chief of Continuous Improvement and Accountability uh, for Sac City Unified School District. And I'm excited tonight to bring uh, part two of our four-part four, four part novella, if you will, of our local control accountability plan development. As we spoke last time, uh, just myself and Mr. Stephen Ramirez Fong, we gave you kind of the framing of where we where we've come uh, in terms of incorporating the feedback from the board workshop and some of the, of course, uh, goal development ideas that the community has expressed. Tonight, we actually move into kind of the the next phase of going deeper in terms of providing a more comprehensive overview of the stakeholder feedback that we've received. And so, I'm excited to to point to the fact that, of course, staff will be presenting a bit tonight, but actually, you'll hear more direct community voice uh, within the presentation. We actually We'll have uh, members of our LCAP PAC. Uh, we'll also have a representative from the American Indian Education Program. And then we'll also have a representative from our Community Advisory Board. But more importantly, I'll just point to the other groups listed here, um, in which, of course, not everybody was able to send a representative to present. Uh, but we have gotten feedback from our English English Learner, D District English Learner Advisory Committee, uh, from our Student Advisory Council. Uh, and then we actually got uh, some proactive feedback uh, from a student group at Luther Burbank High School as well, which we'll, we'll just talk about briefly. Um, and you'll actually get more update directly in terms of their report that they created that you want, they want you to have directly. Um, so tonight, really, the themes are voice, uh, urgency, because obviously we know there's lots of work to be done, uh, trade-offs, because as much as we're, we have many resources available to us, we also recognize that as everyone speaks to us about their priorities, the ranking of those priorities is always the hardest work of the district and of our community partners, and then the evolution, uh, because you know as we think about the LCAP uh, and really think about the fact that it is um, the visible plan of our budget, we actually just directly tying to Chief Business Officers Rose Ramos' presentation, there's still parts of it we're still putting together, literally in real time. So you won't necessarily see the numbers tonight because we actually have to now incorporate uh, the third revised forecast, but that's just a, a foreshadowing that the next time we present to you, which will be at the public hearing on June 10th, you'll see the coming together of the plan and the fiscal implications. Go to the next slide, please. So as we discussed last meeting, really what we I aspire to is that our LCAP really represents the how and the when 
in terms of how do we actually disrupt inequities within our system, document them in ways in which they're clear to yourselves, to our public, and then when are we going to disrupt those inequities by the plans that we have in place in terms of looking at the student outcomes that we look to resolve, the gaps we look to resolve, uh, the achievement we look to, to build and sustain. Uh, and then that allows us then to fulfill the promise of the guiding principle in terms of all students are given an equal opportunity to graduate the greatest number of post-secondary choices from, from the widest array of options. And, and really, as much as those words speak to an aspiration for us, that's what we plan towards. That's why we're building the, the plans at a district level and, of course, obviously with our sites. Can we go to the next slide, please. And so this speaks to the to the voice factor as we think about, um, oh, I'm sorry, if we go to the next, thank you. If we think about stakeholder engagement, that's really where it's the theme of tonight to a large degree is that you'll hear uh, our stakeholder engagement directly, both in terms of the presentation and in terms of actually the voices uh, for, the, for the dominant part of this presentation. And which we know that hearing from our students, hearing from our parents, fellow educators, other community stakeholders uh, is called for, obviously in California Edge Code, but we also know that it's just the right thing to do. And so ultimately tonight we're, we're honoring the fact that we've heard a lot uh, in terms of their aspirations in our community. So go to the next slide. And as a mission, this will continue to evolve. I mean, tonight is a, a marker in the evolution and that you'll hear more concreteness in terms of the goal development. But at the same time, uh, we need to intersect now with the budget. Uh, because ultimately the LCAP only has vi vi vitality if we can make sure we're tying it to our spending decisions as a district. And so that's a major piece that you won't see directly tonight, but that's what it will evolve into when you see this again on June uh, 10th. And of course, obviously continuing to provide the feedback we've heard, looking for the intersectionality of the feedback, uh, where we hear kind of the, the same themes from community and making sure those themes are represented. We go to the next slide. And so this is just a quick reminder, uh, not so much for you, but obviously for our public as well, to, to get a sense of what the LCAP is. Uh, it is a three-year document. We are approving a new three-year process uh, in June, uh, and this will take us from 2021 to 2024. And then again, it lines up our goals, uh, tying to our student needs, the actions, the services, and then of course, most importantly, the student outcomes. And as you spoke earlier tonight in the assessment conversation, those are the things that we're looking to, to resolve. What are those outcomes we're trying to attain on behalf of our students through the great work of our staff? If we go to the next slide. This just gives you the quick timeline. Uh, I think last meeting I spoke to this notion of the marathon and the sprint. The marathon was really all the pre-work uh, that came out of the work of our community engagement, stakeholder engagement through our LCAP PAC. Uh, and the sprint is right now, in which we really are in, this, in, this, in the period of bringing all these things together, bringing to bear the work at hand so that we can present a, a cogent and viable LCAP to you first in the public hearing on June 10th and then for adoption on June 24th. I'll just make mention though, we know it doesn't stop there. The LCAP is not a, a sit on the shelf document. And so, you know, as we spoke last time and you're seeing it in the PowerPoint tonight, we're continuing to work with our communications team because we recognize that access to the LCAP is one way that we can ensure equity, that we've got to do a more effective job of making sure that folks not only see the plan, but can act, access the plan, which gains understanding of the plan, and then they can hold us accountable because they'll know what's in the plan and they can come back to us and say very explicitly, this, you said you're going to do this, how is it going? What are the measurable outcomes? And that's really been the work we're going to do post the adoption in June as we work uh, not just with SCOE to get the final adoption from them, but also to get uh, adherence to the plan and make sure people know what the plan is. Go to the next slide. And then just very quickly, uh, in terms of tonight's presentation, really we're going to come back and, and you hear directly now from our stakeholder groups. On the left side, you see many of the outreach efforts that we've made. I'll say up front, there's always opportunities for us to improve, and we have tried to improve year over year. I mean, obviously we know that you know, there's formal outreach that we do, um, but the listening sessions have been our attempt to engage with stakeholder groups, and they've been informal to some degree. Um, the district surveys have been a, a, you know, one of our ways of engagement as well. As we talk about the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant, um, we've actually incorporated questions on our LCAP survey for that grant. And then obviously next week, you'll hear more specifically about a special initiative that the board adopted for PK to do outreach on a yellow grant as well. So it's those types of innovations that have been important for us. And then of course, obviously you see our, 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 our traditional uh, outreach groups listed. And again, I'll just make mention that the uh, special thanks to the Sacramento area youth speaks at Luther Burbank because they actually proactively reached out to us and gave us their recommendations and, and thoughts. And we were really appreciative of that because that's another punctuation of student voice, which we know is really important in this process. With that, I will now uh, pass the presentation to Gwene Bird, who is a member of our LCAP PAC, and, and she'll take you further now getting into the actual uh, recommendations themselves. Thank you, Vincent. Um, and thank, I, I just want to thank um, Vincent and Stephen for their guidance through this process. They've been very, very helpful and supportive of us. Um, I'm Gwene Bird, parent of two teens at, in Sac City Unified, um, and I'm an LCAP PAC appointee from Trustee Area 1. 
Um, I also just briefly wanted to thank the comms and graphics department for the updated look for this plan. We've been talking about making it more audience friendly and reader friendly, so it's um, it's a lot of information to digest, and so I appreciate the colors and graphics and all that good stuff. Um, and before I get to my slides real briefly, I just wanted to make a few observations about the context for this work. Um, there are, as you know, a lot of stakeholders who've given their input into this plan, many of whom have been traditionally not been represented at school board meetings or in any sort of planning process for curriculum or budget allocation. So I really wanted to urge you to take to, to heart the hard work and thoughtful input that all of these parent and community members have given and keep it in mind as you make decisions for the upcoming year. Their voices are just as important as the stakeholders that we hear from week after week. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight our core value and guiding principle. I know you've heard it and you just saw it in the slides, but it bears repeating to remind the board of our purpose here and why all of us parents agreed to be part of this work. We're passionate about disrupting the current inequitable system and we're seeking bold and some might say radical changes about how this district approaches educating the kids in this district. We spent a lot of time discussing the bigger picture about what it will take to actually ensure that all students in the district graduate with a post-secondary plan. And this really starts in kindergarten and some would say pre-K to guide students on a path of success towards graduation. So this document reflects all of that work. And so please keep all of those groups that this document addresses in mind as you make policy and budget decisions this year. Um, so as we get to the overarching themes, um, we talk about an in, in implementation of an effective MTSS. Um, we, the, the PAC has been um, given some great information. We've been sort of educated about the MTSS system district-wide and um, we are very enthusiastic about the fact that um, that's being incorporated into what we're doing for our kids. Um, I know that you're all familiar with it so I'm not even going to read the bullet points but I just wanted to highlight um, some of the things that we've talked about because for us um, MTSS includes the idea of, re of providing the responsive services to students based on identified need and um, that's so important and you know we've had a lot of talk about assessments and everything else all of this goes to providing individualized supports, which um, are, is very, very important instead of sort of a one-size-fits-all for people, um, for students. And um, so equitable allocation of resources, we want to use data-based decision-making, and that seems like an obvious thing, but so often we feel like we don't get all the data that we maybe need to uh, make those decisions or even to make recommendations, and so that's a very important um, thing for the PAC as well as, as it should be for the board. Um, and then monitoring the effectiveness of actions. Vincent just sort of alluded to that, but you know, accountability for what's working and what's not. I think that's a piece that often gets left out of the mix where um, we implement great systems and then we never come back around to review and see what's working and what's not. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, the, the idea of more individualized supports for students and really pre-K through 12th grade. Um, with a particular focus of, of the groups that, that um, the LCAP uh, re references, the underserved groups that um, need a little bit more um, uh, support. So, you know, we've talked about this idea of um, having an, what we're calling an individualized learning plan for um, these groups of students, these students with dem demonstrated needs. And, and frankly, you know, if, just my personal opinion, I'd, I'd go one step further and say that all students should have something like this because we should be, you know, tracking all kids in terms of where they are and what they need in order to successfully graduate and go into post-secondary um, pursuits. So, but the idea of an individualized learning plan is, is pretty radical in terms of really focusing on um, individualized supports and um, liaisons and, you know, this is going to require more staff and more connections but it really contributes to social and emotional well-being, which is, um, as we all know, a, a very a necessary part of education. Um, next slide, please. Um, and the other thing that we've seen a lot of, or discussed a lot about, is developing a strong foundation in the early grades. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion around college and career readiness that takes place in high school, for example. But we all, there's sort of a consensus that we, we realize this is something that is built from day one as they enter the school system. And this gets back into, and it's in alignment with the idea of developing individualized learning plans, um, noticing what it's going to take through the 12 year cycle of being in Sac City Unified in order to get a child to our ultimate goal of them having as many post-secondary options as possible. It doesn't start in high school, it doesn't start in middle school, it starts in the elementary grades. So, um, you know, there's definitely the focus on literacy and reading proficiency by the third grade, but also other 
um, it, it shouldn't just be about that. Um, there needs to be more interventions and assessments starting at early on and um, in order to keep kids on a trajectory towards success. Um, last slide, please. Last slide for me, anyway. <laughs> um, Increased mental health supports, we've heard a lot about that this year, obviously. There's so much need for mental health supports, and I'm thrilled to hear that the governor has been, has proposed money for mental health supports. Um, we obviously more, need more social workers, mental health counseling. Student support centers should be at all school sites. I know that one of the, um, the school sites that one of my ch children is at is um, so um, active and yet overwhelmed uh, with all the responsibilities that they have, but we really need to, to have more of that. And so our, um, our plan includes the importance of addressing mental health. And um, certainly that should be true whether or not there was a pandemic, but particularly so because as we all know, there's gonna be impacts for many years to come. So um, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Vanessa. Um, thank you, Gwene, uh, and good evening, uh, Superintendent Aguilar, President Pritchett, and members of the board. Um, all stakeholder groups uh, continue to stress the importance for professional development and anti-bias and anti-racist training with an elimination of opt-in clauses around these professional trainings. The message and ethos driven by the district must continue to be one that acknowledges the diversity of our student population with a commitment to to address the systemic structures of racism and generational poverty that impact such a large percentage of our student body. With this in mind, a recommendation made by various stakeholder groups is that our curriculum material and instruction be culturally relevant and historically accurate. The research has clearly demonstrated that cultural and ethnic representation has a positive impact on young people's self-concept, sense of belonging, as well as a sense of empowerment to engage in new behaviors. For anyone that is hesitant on supporting these changes in our curriculum, I would like to remind all of us that the research is also really clear in demonstrating how racism, bias, and xenophobia has a societal cost that is both moral and economical for everyone in the community, regardless of race, ethnic identity, or country of origin. This recommendation to our curriculum serves all of our students. Um, next slide, please. A major recommendation addressed by all stakeholder groups was a desire to see greater coherence and fidelity in the district's tier one programs. Coming from Area 5 in South Sacramento, it is not unusual to hear or to get the impression that for kids to get a great education, they need to be attending a school outside of South Sacramento. This should not be the case, and I am confident that the superintendent and all board members should find that distressing to hear. I know board member Rhodes is working diligently to make sure Southside families can feel confident in their neighborhood schools. For this reason, stakeholder groups want to stress accountability in the coherence and consistency across the district and implementing common assessments and universal design for learning practices across the school sites, regardless of zip code. Next slide, please. With these concepts in mind, it is critical we remember that equity and promoting excellence throughout our district means investing more resources in the families and school sites that have demonstrated the highest needs. Year after year, the district's dashboard has shown little or no progress in the results for our unduplicated student groups, minority students, and special education students. A recommendation is the further desegregation of data while continually striving for transparency on how targeted funds are being used. Stakeholders would like to have enough transparency that we can link targeted funds to programs addressing student needs and that the effectiveness of these uh, interve interventions be reflected in measurable student outcomes, such as the rate of the of UC A through G completion, graduation rates, and percentage of reclassified students. And then that these programs with demonstrated outcomes be replicated and maintained throughout the district. Next slide, please. A consistent theme on the LCAP PAC is a desire to see the return on investments. The LCAP PAC has expressed hopefulness that as the district continues to roll out MTSS, that we will see improvement on the consistency throughout the district of its tier one programs and effective, timely, and proactive targeted supports. 
And yet the promise that MTSS holds to help generate change in our district will not happen without monitoring and accountability of the district's initiatives and plans. Obtaining and implementing professional learning consistently with regular assessment of our whole student body are critical. Without these steps, we will continue to see only pockets of excellence. Let's continue pushing to make our district one that works not just for some, but for all. Thank you, and I'll, I'll pass it on to my next colleague. My name is Dennis Ma. I'm an at-large member of the district's Community Advisory Committee for Special Education. My children attended uh, Sac City schools and graduated from Kennedy High. My grandson currently attends kindergarten in Sac City and has childhood apraxia of speech. It's a neurological motor deficiency, which means the muscles in his brain, the muscles in his mouth that work to create speech are not synchronized with his brain. It occurs in about one out of 4,000 cases. On this slide, what we are doing before wasn't working, so we should think about how to do things differently. The current K-12 system, as we know it today, was invented over 100 years ago by urban school administrators as a management tool, not as a means for promoting student-centered learning for every student. Before then, one-room schoolhouses dotted the country with students of different ages, not differentiated by grade or grade level assignments. Our district's core value is that we recognize our system is inequitable by design, and that we visibly work to confront and interrupt inequalities that exist to create a level playing field. Our question here on this slide is, why disrupt when we have a once in a generation opportunity to redesign a 21st century educational organization that creates caring and confident expert learners? The intersection of technology, likely increased in funding, modern research on how the brain works, and the LCAP provide a unique opportunity to redesign Sac City for all students, including students with disabilities who make up approximately 15% of the enrollment. Now, the current system has really failed our students with disabilities, and there's plenty of evidence. SBAC scores, for example, they're the lowest performing subgroup in the district not because they lack cognitive skills, because the system's attitude that they're different and cannot be included. This is an opportunity to remind everyone that students with disabilities are general education students first. They receive special services to help them be successful in the general ed classroom. About four years ago, the board asked the Council of Great City Schools to do an audit of special ed program. There seems to be a lack of urgency. Not much has been done. We're starting to move this year, I see, in the LCAP. Another example is yesterday, there were still 300 outstanding initial special ed assessments and 491 outstanding triennial assessments, as displayed on the website. Now, the CAC has tried to advise the board on how to solve this and other issues, but it seems to no avail. Bill. The current system for many students is like a car running with four flat tires. For others, it's like writing in a Lexus. Let's go to like slide 17, please. The items list, listed on this slide are all very important, and they all fit very well into uh, universal design for learning and the multi-system of support. But I think what's lacking as a goal for the board is, why do we do all these things? Is it to disrupt the system, or is it trying to create a new system based on universal design for learning and multi-tier system of support? Let's go to the next slide. As I understand it, universal design for learning, students are involved in their education, even in elementary school, but finding out their strengths, their interests, the preferences and, need, and needs to help them become expert learners. That applies to students with disabilities, English learners, foster youth, Title I students, and everyone else. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the experience every student in Sacramento. 
I'm reminded of a story about an autistic student who learned to read in first grade and felt very proud and confident of his achievement. So were his parents. In one of his intermediate grades, when he got to intermediate, his days were spent copying lessons from the whiteboard. He wrote a note to the teacher saying to the effect that copying from the whiteboard was not teaching and learning. He was sent to the office. We're now in the 21st century using a model created in the 19th century. To design a system without inequalities will require the board to work with its labor partners, especially SCTA. Both sides need to start by asking, what would the district look like that focuses on each one of its students becoming an expert learner? Then, how would it be staffed and organized? I noticed in the LCAP process a lack of SETA participant. In this district, I feel that not much can get done unless SETA and the board work together. Even though SETA has bested the district many times in negotiations, there still is a contract that district administrators and staff can use to implement or universal design for learning effectively. Finally, if the board is serious about implementing MTSS and universal design for learning, it should re be reflected in the adopted budget. Thank you. Now. Can we turn to slide 19? Majixis, Sakone Yases, Nuhului. It's a greeting in the Miwok language. My name is Susan Morla, and I'm a member of the Ion Band of Miwok Indians. And I'm also the chair of the American Indian Education Parent Committee. I want to do a quick land acknowledgement. The Sacramento City Unified School District schools sit on the land of the Miwok and Nisenan people. The a, uh, American Indian Education Program Parent Committee is grateful to assist the children, grandchildren, and greats of the first peoples of this territory and many native children of tribes and territories. Um, the American Indian Education Parent Committee would like to thank Mr. Stephen Fong for reaching out to us and uh, meeting with the Parent Committee. As all of these bullets um, in slides 19, 19 through 21 are important to address and are overreaching themes across stakeholder groups, I will jump to the last bullet on page 19 and then go from there with my time. So yes, we need to expand capacity. Currently, there is only one youth program, uh, program associate that is very part-time, and we need more help for our Native students. Uh, we need to expand capacity and resources of the American Indian Education Program to serve a broader range of students, meaning students that identify as American Indian, and not just those students that can show proof of enrollment in a federal tribe um, or a paper trail of who their ancestors are. As I am Miwok, a parent, of children in the, in the district for the last 15 years. And as the parent committee chair, I feel we're creating an in inequality by not allowing children who identify as American Indian to fully utilize the um, American Indian education program services offered, like tutoring. Another inequality that needs immediate attention that directly affects our native children and families, both their mental and psychological wellness, is changing the names of the schools that have already been identified as offensive, uh, schools named after individuals who have committed hate crimes against the indigenous people. We have fought for these changes for years and over a year ago felt change was coming, only to be put on the back burner to win. I was selected to be a part of the renaming committee last October, and I now sit here and I'm losing confidence not only in the school district, but the third party firm that was hired around early December to help with the needed capacity and streamlining of the process. We would like SEUSD to be an example and show the, dif the difference in how they will treat and hear the Native community. Handle this matter as you would a hate crime against any other group. Let's get it done. And the American Indian Education Parent Committee does look forward to working collaboratively to create change and a positive experience for all Native students and families. And with that, I will turn it over to staff. Well, good evening, board, superintendent, and community members. And then thank you, Gwene, Vanessa, Dennis, and Susan. Um, it's a privilege to share the virtual podium with you. And I think, uh, you know, everyone just got a brief sense of just the power of community voice and, and the privilege certainly some of us have to meet with 
uh, members of these groups r routinely. And so I uh, really can't appreciate you all enough for being here this evening to share your experience and your recommendations. And can we advance to slide um, 22, please? Um, you know, so I don't want to spend too much time on, on these slides rehashing some of what you just shared, but I think it's important to uh, note that the LCAP survey that was completed um, really did provide the opportunity um, to have a lot of the overarching themes and priorities that you've seen in the slides or heard previously uh, reaffirmed. Um, career technical education, counseling, um, individualized supports, and mental health were all identified as really key priorities. And those align to what you've heard this evening and also previously. Um, we also learned from the survey, those that responded, um, that there's just not a lot of awareness around some of our LCAP actions and some of the district programs that we offer. And a major effort moving forward will be, um, to Chief Harris's point, we'll be educating uh, the community on what we do provide for um, students and families and, and how they can access those services. Uh, and, and that is exciting work for us to be partnering with the communications team and also other colleagues across departments. And next slide, please. Well, the survey also really further emphasized themes you've heard again uh, tonight, anti-racism efforts, um, the need for um, prevention and intervention around bullying, um, of course, professional development across a number of areas in culture and climate, uh, and again, reiterating the importance of translation and uh, interpretation services. Um, the respondents uh, also showed strong interest in, in continuing to access and understand how to take advantage of the fingerprinting services for volunteers to make sure that we can continue to recruit all uh, community members and parents as volunteers. Um, specific to learning recovery, um, there was a high priority placed on one-on-one -on -one tutoring, mental health, school meal access, and before and after school programs. Uh, but it is important to say that um, respondents in general indicated that all the learning recovery areas were important to them. There were no areas that were not seen as important. Uh, and for the parent caregiver experience questions we asked, um, really identified some key needs in the area of supporting um, our caregivers to advocate on behalf of their student, providing tools and capacity building to engage in advocacy, um, to include our community in decision making, and also to make clear how decisions are made um, so that they can access those channels. Next slide, please. Um, the listening sessions you know, took the form of discussions in, in many cases, um, and we saw, again, echoes of many key themes. Um, without reading each bullet point, you can see some of those themes um, being reiterated here. Um, but we also um, heard some uh, unique pieces pop out, such as grading systems and really the need for um, greater access, clarity, transparency for parents around grading. Um, really heard the overarching theme around centering and building relationships as being critical, and particularly as we look at uh, coming back um, in the summer with students and in the fall needing to address trauma, needing to address the social emotional components as a precursor to being able to do academic work with our students. And, and the last bullet here, really this idea that uh, flexibility has to be built into anything we do, that different families and students are gonna need different levels of support. And that's something you also heard earlier tonight around that individualized learning plan piece. Next slide, please. Uh, so we shared last update, um, just that you know, we can't really um, uh, overstate the importance of stakeholder input and how it's driven a lot of the changes in this LCAP. Uh, you know, from the goals to the metrics, the actions, you heard about disaggregation of data, uh, that maintaining of the budget transparency, those are all pieces that we are really working on actively and have worked on as a result of stakeholder input. Um, so that's important to say, but it's also important to note that there are gonna be areas that we'll see in the LCAP where we don't see some of the stakeholder input fully reflected yet. And, and that's the reality of, we don't have plans in place in every case to be able to act on all the recommendations immediately. And, and that's um, part of that ongoing and evolving work uh, that Chief Harris noted and it's the urgency. We know there's things that are really important to be addressing and we don't have all the solutions now. And the, the important part of the input piece is to be able to reflect where that input um, and the actual plan that has a gap and then to leave that really transparently in the record so we can use that moving forward as a guide in future years. Next slide, please. Well, th this slide and the, and the following two just show some examples of where input has um, had influence I and mean, certainly it's brief because it's what can fit on a single slide, but just showing that throughout the, the major LCAP goals, that really when you look at those goal statements, there's clear linkages to the things we've heard from community and trying to um, shape those goals so they reflect those priorities that we're hearing and come from our different community groups. And next slide. And similarly with metrics, 
Um, there's a, a range of metrics that have been built into the LCAP that are specifically coming from the call from our, our stakeholders. And it's exciting because I was just in a conversation earlier today where you know, staff are having additional discussions based on some of these uh, metrics that we're building into the LCAP. Um, and so really it's this creating these back and forth and reciprocal channels you know, between the community and staff to be able to hear what uh, is of interest and priority for our stakeholders and then to start having conversations with staff to uh, you know, determine how do we meet those interests. Next slide, please. And then lastly, actions. And I think this is you know, the piece of that evolving nature. And, and as we move forward, um, where will actions continue to evolve over the next three years um, as we um, continue to roll out you know, programs that are starting now and also to identify new actions um, based on the input we're seeing. Next slide, please. And lastly, just noting that, um, you know, uh, Chief Harris shared the slide that, you know, this is an ongoing process. Um, even since we've prepared this board item, you know, in the last week, we've met with the PAC again and have um, a tremendous amount of very valuable guidance that is going to help us reshape some of our plan summary and some of the other documents that we're preparing. Uh, and, and so it is truly an evolving process where um, every single, uh, you know, moment in time, we're sharing where we're at at that moment and then it's continuing to evolve. Um, so I really want to um, echo Chief Harris's um, special shout out to the SES class at Luther Burbank um, for being proactive, um, you know, for helping to elevate student voice. Um, their advocacy along with you know, the continued leadership, of course, of the Student Advisory Council is really a, a very critical you know, component for this process. We want to build on that example. Um, and one last thank you again to you know, Gwene, Vanessa, Dennis, and Susan. Um, I think that it is um, a presentation that I'm honored to be a part of. Um, alongside the four of you for speaking. So thank you so much. And with that, um, I think we're all available for questions. All right. I believe we have three live comments. <laughs> Anna Molander. Good evening, it's Anna Molander with the Sac City Parents and Caregivers Union. I want to start out by thanking all the parents and caregivers that served on these committees and provided such incredible input. Um, kind of jumping off from what was talked about in the budget and how the LCAP will be changing coming up is that we have an opportunity to truly implement the LCAP that these parents have laid out and researched. And one of the big issues that we're going to see coming forward is that this next school year needs to be the best school year our children have ever had in the school district. They've suffered too much. And so in this next school year, we're asking that you consider reducing class sizes. There's additional money in the budget, um, the, the May revise from the governor's office that would allow for that and also allow for the opportunity to have more classroom aids and more support services on school sites. Uh, it's an important opportunity for this district to really dream big for this next school year and to give our children exactly what they deserve and they need. They've suffered the most in this pandemic and they suffered without being ha having any opportunity to make choices, choices that adults did make on their behalf. So let's do the best that we can as a school district and really give them the school year that they deserve with smaller class sizes and more services and supports at every school site. Um, I, I urge you to please fully implement the LCAP plan uh, that these parents have worked so hard to develop. Thank you. Before our next comment, um, it is 1029 and we need to extend this meeting. So can I get a motion to extend to 1130? Second. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. <laughs> next comment. Sorry. Terrence Gladney. Um, I want to start by saying, like, it's been said at multiple board meetings um, that, you know, you guys pressing is not to respond to public comment, but I feel like you guys are extremely selective in which ones you choose to incorporate in your responses. Um, so I'm just asking for some consistency. Um, I make multiple comments or, uh, you know, seek additional insight from you guys on the dais or on the floor, wherever you are. And you guys are very selective in what you choose to incorporate. I don't know if that's because the information I'm presenting is irrefutable or it's irrelevant. But when I speak as a parent of a 4.0 plus black student, what I'm saying is if she 
is not willing to return to school, then how can someone else who is not successful somehow within your system be expected to be enthusiastic about returning? So if you choose to address some, please address all, or, you know, I'm just asking for consistency. Um, you know, I'm going to repeat comments that I, that I, that I uh, provided at a listening session. Um, how far are we truly willing to go? Are we willing to disrupt the norm? The sacred cows like Sutter, that's been you know presented months before to to echo the uh, the uh, the the woman from the Indian Education Program. Um, that is still in a stalemate, and it should have been brought forward for action, but yet it still bears the name of an oppressive leader. That is our value statement. Our LCAP is our value statement by our expenditures and our actions. Actions dictate what we truly set as priorities. But we have things such as the renaming of oppressively named institutions where our students walk into every day still on the back burner and i've been told this is going to be put off till september um you know i would love to see the reincorporation of community-led initiatives such as participatory budgeting which was a very powerful effort and provided a lot of insight and they had a great cross-section of stakeholders and you know if we really want to identify if we have a, a, a deficit, we need to find out if it's a spending deficit or a revenue deficit. We need to build our budget from the school side up and figure out where we run out of money. Let's not look at what we spent and say where we need to cut. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Gladney. That was the last comment. No, Renee Webster Hawkins and Sarah Williams Kingsley have a combined comment. Okay. Good evening, President Pritchett and educational leaders. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and members of the Coalition for Students with Disabilities. The LCAP plan that you will be adopting in June is truly once in a generation chance to set the blueprint for disrupting the status quo and creating a system intentionally designed to ensure that all students graduate, including those with disabilities. Now is the moment for the district to stop hand-wringing, to stop blaming lack of funding um, or other educational leaders. And as, Mr. as Member Rhodes said at the last board meeting, we need to do better. And now is the moment to truly improve access to education for students with disabilities. And there are two specific goals that should be woven through this LCAP with corresponding actions and metrics to directly move the needle for students with disabilities. The first goal is to fully and effectively implement early child fine. This is more than just the district's federal legal obligation to identify all students suspected of having a disability. It is the linchpin in serving students with disabilities. The 2017 Council of Great City Schools audit documented how this district is disproportionately failing in the child fine and instead um, the district is entrenched in the wait to fail model in which teachers are not eager to exercise their obligation to refer students for evaluations. Instead, the district must vigorously implement the district's MTSS framework as reflected in this LCAP plan, including early assessments and high quality teaching in all classrooms at all sites with fidelity. The second broad goal is that the district needs to demonstrate an authentic commitment to inclusion. The LCAP uses the word coherence a lot. It's inclusion is what we need. What would this look like? I'm going to start with three things that need to stop now. We need to end unlawful segregation in special day classes. We need to end unlawful exclusionary discipline and bullying from other students and even teachers. And we need to end the exclusionary practice of sending struggling readers out of a general education classroom and displacing them down the hall with a reading specialist or to a resource room. What we do need to do, all of our general education teachers must become experts in differentiated instruction in literacy and math using evidence-based instructional practices with fidelity. And then secondly, we need to build the pipeline every step of the way, beginning in kindergarten for every student to graduate with a college, career, or independent living plan. Please, I know each of you has three hours set aside in your schedule in the next couple of weeks to read the LCAP draft cover to cover. I hope I'm not joking. 
you really are, you need to do this because it is one of your, your gravest responsibilities. And you should be looking for it to be sure that it's saturated with actions and measures that ensure that every student is accessing grade level curriculum and receiving appropriate supports in their general education class first. If our district is to become authentically equitable and inclusive of all students, including the 7,000 with disabilities, the LCAP should be an aggressive roadmap for providing these resources and expectations for every general education teacher who works in the district to commit to teaching all students, including those with disabilities. I really, um, really appreciate your consideration of our comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webster Hawkins. I want to remind the board, this is an informational item only. Do we have any comments or questions? Emma Morosky? I know it's late, it'll be super quick, thank you. Um, I just uh, really appreciate the additional stakeholder engagement that was done this year, and I would um, I would definitely support, um, I'm not sure if my colleagues on the ad hoc uh, stakeholder committee are looking at um, a board policy that would kind of solidify some of this enhanced stakeholder engagement, but I would be very supportive of moving in that direction if, um, if, if that's an idea you're willing to entertain. Um, I wanted to thank our LCAP volunteers. Uh, you're amazingly eloquent on the challenges of the, of the district and where we need to go, and I just really appreciate the, your leadership. Um, on implementation accountability is one thing that was mentioned. I think that's really critical that we need to have a framework for accountability, that we need to communicate that clearly come back you know I, th I would like to work on that this summer um to come you know to develop a way to come back regularly with updates on where we are you know i think that this this is this is foundational for our district this is like this should be where we need to go um you know our, our success should be measured in in this framework so i look forward to um, working on that there's a couple of things i'm concerned that are not included um, I would like to follow up on um, Ms. Webster Hawkins' comments on inclusion and um, making sure this this will move the needle on some critical issues regarding students with disabilities. Um, I am a little concerned there's no kind of organizational continuous improvement um, in terms of like the district's functions. There was an operational excellence um, kind of goal in the last uh, LCAP. This one seems a little more bland um, of like just establishing or continuing baseline operations or something like that but i think we should also try to step it up i've heard a lot of areas where the district can improve operations so um that's something i would like to see and i, I want to make sure that you know that that there's clear goals around um early literacy um I think that's just so so important and I'm not sure where exactly and I know we have like the an audacious goal around college and career readiness I I, I love that um I would like to see something similar around early literacy as well I'll leave it there thank you so much for all your work all right any other board comments or questions member student member shake Super quickly. Um, quickly, I wanted to apologize on behalf of the Student Advisory Council. We wanted to send somebody, but it is AP test weeks and people are um, very busy. So um, in lieu of that, we did want to thank uh, Chief Harris and Mr. Ramirez Fonker consistently um, involving the council and taking our feedback incredibly seriously and developing these fantastic plans that collate all these um, stakeholder recommendations. I know in the ad hoc committee, it was very useful to us. Um, and it's just a wonderful presentation. I, I looked through the slides earlier today and I went through it again today. Um, and all of the shareholder committees, all of the staff involved, um, just a huge round of applause. Member Keep beating you today. <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, 
really um, uplift all the work that staff did on reaching out to stakeholders outside or beyond the LCAP pack. Um, I was able to participate at one of the stakeholder sessions and um, it was a very authentic discussion. And um, in this particular um, session, we had a parent with um, with elementary school um, a student and, and just really focusing on the importance of early literacy and, um, and also um, ensuring the, um, the continuous feedback between the um, teacher and the parent so that the parent can you know continue to support the um the, the student at home etc so um i i just wanted to um also highlight that there are a lot of recommendations here that i think um we can finally talk about making some really um uh incredible investments um, and really transform our um, the opportunities for our students but also make a big investment for our um, workforce and I'm, I'm really excited about that too so um, just you know as some of the callers have pointed out there is um, the governor's um, you know budget proposal or may revise is as he's calling um, is to transform our um, K-12, our uh, TK-12 system. And I look forward to really um, sort of taking that um, and moving forward in a way that we can have a huge positive impact to our entire system, bottom up, top down. So, um, and everybody in between, of course. So, um, so anyway, just wanted to also, again, highlight the work that these um, staff did in reaching out to um, additional stakeholders and support board member Morawski's um, a recommendation to look into maybe formalizing or um, um, memorializing a, a more stable path to, um, to ensuring that we um, continue to include um, stakeholders. Member Rhodes. Yes. Um, I'll be quick. This was a Vincent hat off. I don't have a hat, but you know what I mean. Um, it's 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 uh it's heartwarming to me because I just recently came from the LCAP committee um, as as a parent participant, and um, the work that you guys have built on from the time that I've been there, the work you continue to build, and how you've engaged. Um, and and we know that LCAP sometimes it feels like you're not being heard sometimes, but uh, through that feeling, um, able to push forward and really uh, galvanize around the idea of what we could be um, and articulately speak towards our stakeholders and to the board around those topics. Um, it is amazing. And so to the LCAP, I appreciate you guys, Vincent, Stephen, you guys have done a great job. Um, I'm not gonna echo too much from what my colleagues have said, because they also spoke articulately about those things. I do have one question. Um, and I think Susan, Susan uh, Morris, she said it, um, around the changing of names, I remember that the, the way we did talk about that in October, I wasn't on the board then, but we have appointed people um, and then it kind of died out. I've had people reach out to me about that as well uh, from my area in area five. Um, what are we doing towards that? I didn't want to leave her comment and let it just sit there. I, what, what are we doing towards that? What is the expected timeline to where we, we uh, regroup and we talk about those name changes? Um, and when can uh, our stakeholders and parents that are part of that group that were appointed expect to hear back and on a date? And I, I know Vince, you might not have asked that question, but it was just a, I just wanted to acknowledge of what she said. I think we probably need to reach out and, um, to our facilities department because they were working with the group um, for the nation. Nathaniel? Nathaniel, yeah. Nathaniel, Sorry. yeah. Sorry, Nathaniel, I know your name. Yeah, I so we, we can reach out to Nathaniel and, um, and have him bring, bring back the board. I can answer member Rose's question if needed. I, 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 I appointed great, myself yeah. to the committee. So I, we received a letter from Nathaniel back in March, uh, essentially with, oh, is it, is it on? No, it was on. Uh, anyways, we received a letter in March. Uh, all the members were appointed to that committee, um, essentially saying we'll regroup in August 2021. So if that answers your question. Regroup August 2021? At the end, because of um, other work the facilities is doing, this was pushed off until August. Amazing. Um, I have a, a appointee from my area who has not received that. So um, just, just because communications have came to me around that and Ms. Mora has brought it up as well. Thank you for uh, 
giving that information. Maybe give your appointee Nathaniel's email address and ask her to reach out or reach out to Nathaniel and ask her, ask him I'll re- to reach, I'll reach out. out. I'll reach out to Nathaniel personally. Okay. I, know, I know how to reach out to now. I appreciate that. And thank you, uh, Susan, also for your uh, time and your commitment. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you, student member Shake, for the answer. All right. Uh, thank you. President to- Pritchett, can I just make oh, a very quick course, comment? I know that it's Go late, ahead. but, um, but uh, just because I see a through line between several of the presentations today, we spoke about uh, the uh, assessment uh, topic, for example, and I just want to thank everybody that's been involved, um, giving input, in particular the LCAP PAC members. Um, we really do think, um, even though it wasn't presented today, I know you've seen that infographic of the alignment that we see in the future between our budgeting, the LCAP, the SIPSA process, um, and so I'm hopeful that our board um, can just be reminded of that and remember that infographic, um, because that is is what we see as our path for transforming this district um, in how we choose to allocate resources in the metrics that are included as part of the LCAP goals uh, that are very specific. Um, They are um, very appropriate also in my mind. Again, um, they come from lots and lots of hours and investment of time and energy from uh, individuals that are committed uh, to seeing this district thrive. Um, and we certainly have probably not done enough of, of, of telling that story uh, through the LCAP lens. Um, and we have a long ways to go uh, as it relates specifically uh, to how the LCAP is perceived in light of SIPSA development, but it is still our working theory of improvement, if you will, and I hope that the board will continue to um, uh, stay focused on, on, on actualizing that, uh, that, that through line between the LCAP and everything that we do in the district. Perfect. Thank you, Superintendent. And thank you, staff. And thank you to all of our LCAP PAX members for all of your hard work on this recommendations. We look forward to having you back. All right. And, uh, like I said, this is informational, so we'll have you back. Thank you. Uh, item 10.3, approve AB 1200, disclosure and approval of one-time stipend for health and safety trainings for non-representative confidential employees for on-site Training for safely reopening schools to in, in to in person instruction services. Ms. Ramos, yes, this will be pretty brief. Uh, President Richard, you just um, explained basically what um, the district is seeking approval for. It's for the non-represented confidential employees. Uh, next slide, and of course, this is for uh, training and preparation uh, for staff and students returning to on-site instruction. Um, the estimated cost. Next slide, please for the $750 a stipend per employee in these groups is $109,000. Uh, the funding will be coming from the AB 86 in-person instruction funds and it is a one-time cost and the net impact to the budget is zero because the funds are available in the budget. And so that concludes it if there are any questions and there's a full AB 1200 disclosure in the uh, full board packet as required. Great, thank you. We have one live comment. No, no live comment. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. My mistake. Um, any board discussion? All right. Can I get President Pritchett? I just want to very quickly know oh, Mr. Ramos uh, was very, very quick there, um, uh, and, and just being respectful of uh, of our lingo, if you will. Um, this would cover uh, the stipend cost for individuals that are not represented by a labor group. Uh, so that's the term unrepresented. Um, we have. Uh, Uh, about 140 or so individuals uh, that uh, serve in a capacity where they are not represented. And so traditionally what we have done is we have waited um, for agreements to take place with uh, uh, labor partners that represent uh, employees and then extend um, uh, something similar, if you will, to those employees that are not represented. So the cost of $109,000 represents um, the, uh, the stipends to those individuals. All right. We have a motion on the table. Second. 
Again, student preferential vote. Aye. Superintendent roll call. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morowski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips. Aye. All right. Item 10.4, approve revised 2021 superintendent's cabinet salary schedule. Superintendent and Ms. McCarn. Miss McCorn is oh, on her way. <laughs> Thank you, Miss McCorn. We get to see you in real life. <laughs> see me in real life. Good evening, um, Board President Pritchett, members of the board, and Superintendent Aguilar. Let's go ahead to the next slide. We are going to um, share with you uh, uh, the revised 2020-21 Superintendent's Cabinet Salary Schedule, specifically looking at one position. So for just a bit of background, the Chief Operations Officer position, which has been vacant since about November 2019, is a position that oversaw facilities, nutrition, transportation, um, maintenance and operation. And those duties were transferred at the time to the Chief Business Officer position. So since that time, the CBO has overseen all of those departments within the district. Um, go ahead, next slide. So what the district did is a um, comparability study to look at positions, other positions in other districts that similarly had the CBO encompassing lots of different um, additional duties as described, right? The facilities, the maintenance, the transportation, nutrition. And what we found is that based on our then current, now current salary schedule, it was not comparable. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So based on both the changes in the job duties, as well as how it compared um, to other places, what what um, is being considered is revising the job description for the chief business officer to be the chief business office chief business and operations officer to more appropriately um, identify what is the current reality for the position next slide please and this is just a little visual that, that we think helps capture what was happening. The CBO position, as it was previously in the district, oversaw business services. And business services in and of itself is budget, it's accounting, it's risk management, it's payroll, it's benefits. All of those are in business services. And what you can see with the arrow to the chief business and operations officer, are essentially combining those two, those two positions. So it would still include all of those positions, those departments I just mentioned, with the added maintenance operations, facilities, transportation, and nutrition departments. Next slide, please. So by doing this, what would happen is what you can see on the screen is a revised superintendent's cabinet 2021 salary schedule. It would move the chief business and operations officer, actually create that title, and uh, create a new, a new row that would identify the, um, the salary based on, on the comparability as well as the added duties to the job description. So if you approve this is what the job description, I mean, the salary schedule would look like. Next slide, please. And so with that, I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you, uh, Chief McCarn. I just wanted to 
just highlight a couple of things on this recommendation, uh, board members. Uh, going back to the first slide, um, in fact, um, for um, several positions that we have brought forward uh, to the board, um, it has been the result of collapsing positions um, in most cases, in this case, we did not fill the chief operations officer. So when we uh, uh, recruited for the CBO position, the job description uh, did not include the responsibilities that Ms. Ramos eventually agreed to take on. Um, again, uh, in light of the budget challenges, we chose uh, uh, to collapse that chief um, operations officer position. And Ms. Rose was kind enough to agree to take on those added responsibilities. Given her previous experience uh, overseeing some of that in her um, previous post, I, 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 I asked her if she could support us with that. And as you know, uh, with uh, so many of the challenges that we have faced, but in particular, um, the pandemic uh, facilities, maintenance operations, of course, uh, became a very serious matter for us to continue serving our students and our families. And as you know, when we did uh, recruit for the CBO position, that was also uh, a time of great concern uh, from a fiscal perspective. And so uh, the expectations to make sure that uh, we could begin to rectify uh, past practices and procedures and processes was of critical uh, concern to us. And she uh, took on that responsibility as well. Um, so uh, uh, this recommendation comes from um, uh, just a genuine uh, concern uh, that uh, we uh, had to uh, collapse uh, all of those responsibilities and she uh, agreed to take on those responsibilities. Um, and so that is the basis for this recommendation. Uh, we are not coming uh, uh, with a thought that we would uh, create uh, another uh, chief operations officer position. This this essentially collapses uh, two uh, cabinet level positions into one and recognizes, uh, again, the work that Ms. Ramos has been doing uh, since, she, since she arrived. Thank you. Uh, we have three live comments on this agenda topic. Terrence Gladney. Good evening again. I want to start by saying that this item was not listed in the bullet uh, available for public comment, and it doesn't seem to be unintentional. Um, in the past, uh, board comments and superintendents' uh, remarks or reports have also not been available. Um, I would look for a more comprehensive process if we're going to have to respond by 12. It's easy for someone to overlook and think that this was not even an agenda item. Um, I do want to say that I've served on multiple committees with uh, Ms. Ramos, and I value her contribution. But multiple times tonight has been stated that we need to link expenditures to outcomes. If she is a chief business officer and we're in a fiscal crisis, as you guys call it, then how do we reward that? Um, I operate in multiple facility spaces as an advocate and, and volunteer. And I would say that a lot of the things that Kathy Allen did, Nathaniel is undertaking. Um, I think that this is a hollow presentation and I would like to see a matrix of specific duties of the COO that have been passed to the CBO, not oversight. Oversight is not a responsibility. Oversight is just a very vague term and it could mean one of two things. It could mean just literally just oversight seeing or it could mean getting your hands dirty and doing the work and i would expect that there would be more details around this if we're talking about expending dollars to a position that you know per a structural deficit in language has not served our district well in years past so i would expect that you guys will pull this and ask for more data and i understand that there are some you know limitations around hr processes but a posting of a position is public information so i'd expect that you guys would ask for more details about which specific duties and responsibilities have been passed or combined um you know i, I would just think that that would just be better business practice thank you thank you next comment Nick nikki malevsky
Good evening, Nikki Malewski, SCTA. When we first saw this item on the revised board packet agenda, we thought this must be a joke. Superintendent Aguilar, who himself took a $35,000 increase in total compensation after promising our community he wouldn't do so, could not really be proposing that the chief business officer be granted a 16.8% increase or $34,000 more, could he? But it's true. If this board approves this increase, that means the only two employees in the whole district that have received salary increases since 2019 are the superintendent and the CBO. This is at the same time that the district is closing positions and laying off more than 100 certificate educators and even more classified staff. <clears throat> and this is also the time, the same time that the district is demanding a reduction in take home pay of educators by $750 a month. Under the leadership of Superintendent Aguilar and Ms. Ramos, the district has systematically misled our community about the district's finances and as a result has deprived students of millions of dollars worth of improved services. Think about it. If Ms. Ramos's projections were correct, which they have not been since she began here, that means that SEUSD is one of the worst financially performing districts in the entire state. In approving the last budget, a majority of this board appropriately rejected the recommendations of Ms. Ramos and Superintendent Aguilar to certify the budget as negative, when it actually met the standards to be certified as positive. <clears throat> And when Dave Gordon of SCOE unilaterally reversed the elected board certification, Ms. Ramos, along with Superintendent Aguilar and Board President Pritchett, failed to inform the school board that SEUSD had the right to appeal that decision. Look, $6 million in purchasing mistakes, $85 million errors in the budget projections, failing to be transparent with the school board and the public, demanding $750 per month reduction in take home pay of teachers. Thank you, Ms. Molesky, please wrap it up. Of a national teacher shortage, the district under the threat of funding cuts for its failure to provide services to students with disabilities. Now is not the time to increase the salary schedule for the CBO. Thank you, Ms. No, and no other administrator should get pay increase until the district is prepared to give all other employees the same 16.8% increase too. Thank you very much. Ms. Molesky. Mo, Next comment. Mo Kashmiri. Hi everybody, this is Mo Kashmiri. Um, you know, I, Nikki took the words out of my mouth mostly, and, and you know, I, I'm outraged as a parent. Do you tell me that we can't afford services for our students, but every time the folks at the top want an increase, we've got plenty of money for that? That's messed up. That is the wrong values. That is the opposite of leadership. We, if you want to give her a $16,000, $30,000 increase, you know, why aren't we giving that kind of same thing to the folks in our, that teach our kids, the staff that are classified? Now, this is messed up. You know, you know how many people outside of the 20 people who watch these board meetings know Rose Ramos's name? You know, nobody. Nobody knows Rose Ramos's name. The people who care, the kids and the parents know our teacher's name. They know our staff's name. They know the folks that do the frontline work. And those are the ones we should be prioritizing, not the ones at the top. I'm sure this job is complicated, but I'm pretty sure it's not more complicated than the state of California's governor's salary. And so I don't really understand why we need to be paying the top folks above the governor's salary when we can't even put teachers in the sites. We still have 100 school, we still have 100 spots of teachers that we can't fill right now. And you're going to give them an increase? This is obscene, it's wrong, it's messed up, and it's the opposite of leadership. I expect you to reject this. Thank you. Any other comments? There are no more comments for this item. Okay, perfect. I'll open this up for board discussion. Member Rhodes. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Um, so th this position is a um, combination of her current position and the chief operations officer position. Correct. Um, Member Rhodes, before um, you were on our board, um, there were two cabinet level positions. One was the CBO position and the other was a chief operations officer who was responsible for um, what essentially has now been collapsed into one position. 
Okay, and the and the chief operation uh, officer position, how much were they get? How much did they get paid? What, what was that? What was their salary step usually? Uh, yeah, Miss McCarn can can on slide number six. Yeah, that's what I was. Um, there's the salary schedule. Mm -hmm. The ones that you see at the towards the bottom that say range twenty nine, it was in that group. So ranging from the one thirty nine six zero two to the 175079 it was in that group okay and so we so so think of uh, member roads think of two positions in that range right and then now one position and one position so we would act, we we're actually we're saving money by not hiring out that position and combining it right correct okay because you're so, going from from two again cabinet chief positions to one right okay and then um i i guess for me one of my my sticking points here is um like having continued expenditures out in the out years uh, when we're talking about a uh, projected structural deficit um it's just hard to swallow that we're, we're going to take this extra expense on currently um, even though we have like money coming in and all that stuff um as my colleagues would say it's one-time funds um and so it's a, it's a it's a tough one here for me currently I, I do understand what you guys are talking about in the combination and how we'll be saving money and rose taking on those extra job responsibilities um but i i too would like to see kind of more of like the, the the new job description of what that looks like uh feel more comfortable that way um but that those are just my uh thoughts uh currently i look forward to hearing more of the thoughts of my my colleagues around this subject uh to maybe gain more clarity um but right now it's, it's really hard for me to um like say yeah so i would love to hear more from everyone yeah, um, I think tonight's third interim presentation demonstrated how lucky of a district we are to have Rose Ramos on our staff um, from the beginning of my tenure, actually before my tenure, when I used to sit over there in the audience chairs and listen to um, Ms. Ramos's presentations, her ability to um, take on the challenges that we're in. I mean, you know, you, we, we heard comments attributing um, the de deficit to her, which is, in, you know, she the deficit preceded her and she's been willing to take this on and digest this information in a way that the public and board can process. Um, and I think if she's doing two jobs, it only makes sense that we should bump her salary. And so I'm fully in support of this and I'll motion for it at the appropriate time. Thank you, student member Sheik. I could have said that better myself. <laughs> and member Garcia. Um, yes, yeah, so I wanted to also talk about um, sort of the collapsing of the positions. Um, this is a position that was already in the budget, right? Um, so we're just closing out one position and shifting those responsibilities to our current CBO and then changing the title. Um, and by virtual collapsing two positions, um, there's a savings that comes with that. Can you talk a little bit about the net savings, not only in terms of salary, but also benefits? Yeah, correct. I don't have the exact numbers, um, Member Garcia, but um, that, that essentially is what we are doing when we, uh, if you look back at the timing of the recruitment for the CBO position and the retirement of the uh, former individual that was serving as the chief operations officer, um, I felt that um, where we were at that point, and given Ms. Ramos's experience in her previous post, I asked her if we could, um, uh, if, if she would consider supporting us while we looked at uh, options uh, for filling at the time the chief operations officer. Eventually, I made the decision just to have her continue to 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 do that, and just as she um, began to create a stronger uh, infrastructure, if you will, in the business services division, she started to do the same in the facilities maintenance operation position as well, and uh, it became a much more serious. 
uh, endeavor for us uh, as 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 the pandemic uh, uh, came about, of course, and 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 facilities operation maintenance, of course, became even more critical to to this organization. While at the same time, she has continued to, I think, uh, demonstrate um, uh, tremendous leadership in the business services division. And so I think that what uh, Chief McCarn explained in the infographic, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, it's I, I couldn't explain it any clearer uh, on uh, slide uh, five, um, uh, which just shows uh, the the additional responsibilities that uh, that Miss Rose uh, that Miss Ramos has uh, essentially overseen since pretty much her arrival, um, and um, this is actually not even going back to compensate her for for all of that time period, um, which which I think uh, also adds to the to the savings uh, of of this decision and recommendation. Um, so just um, a, another question. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about sort of um, what board member Rhodes um, brought up and as well as one of our public comment um, commenters um, regarding maybe like what the job responsibilities look like? Um, I know that CBOs, uh, that position alone is a lot of work. So combining all of these, I'm just wondering what that sort of position now, all the responsibilities, oversight, and, and workload looks like um, so that we can have just a more clear understanding. Perhaps Ms. McCarn, uh, just in her role um, overseeing HR, might have a have um, uh, a better sense, um, but it certainly means oversight of a lot more individuals. For example, um, uh, as you know, our nutrition services department has hundreds of employees, just that unit alone, uh, not, uh, not considering our maintenance and operations, our facilities, our transportation, uh, the supervision of uh, staff that are overseeing um, uh, modernization, the central kitchen, the transportation yard, uh, those are all things that uh, uh, previously would have been overseen by the chief operations officer. Uh, now that all falls under Ms. Ramos as well. Um, so the alternative, of course, is going back to a different model where we have uh, two positions um, uh, with separate responsibilities, but uh, uh, as as a superintendent, I'm, I'm I'm recommending that we continue with the uh, with 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 this with this arrangement, which which I think we benefit from uh, because of Ms. Ramos's experience in this area. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, Member Garcia, for the questions and the clarifying questions. Uh, those were helpful. Um, and so I, I guess I'll, I'll ask this question. Uh, so does this uh, new position that's being created, um, does it, uh, what is the impacts for our long-term budget? Is it net zero? It has, does it impact our budget in a negative way long-term? Or And then also, Member Garcia also pointed to the uh, possible savings. So is this a net savings to our budget or or is it just a sit the same? Yeah, and, and we can <clears throat> certainly provide, uh, you know, details down to maybe specific dollar amounts, uh, member roads, but again, at the highest level, you're taking two separate positions, salary and benefits, um, uh, because the uh, salary structure that Ms. Uh, McCarn uh, referenced in the presentation doesn't include benefit structure or benefit expenses. Uh, so you're basically taking uh, two positions, full salaries and benefits, and making one. Uh, so, so yes, there, there would be a savings um, because you're eliminating one of those positions. This is an area, of course, that um, as, as, as disempowering as it is, um, it is one that we uh, discussed with SCOE uh, as uh, in, in their role uh, overseeing our, our budget, of course, and um, uh, would imagine that uh, they, they too would agree that, uh, that this results in, 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 in a savings given their, their oversight of our, of our budget and the concerns that they've shared about our expenditures as well. So, um, 
again, we can give that information to you uh, down to a dollar amount, but uh, at the highest level, uh, you can kind of do some of the math just based on that salary structure. Right. I, I, I think that, um, I, thank you for your explanation. I, uh, I would like to see, I would like to see the numbers, uh, personally. Um, I would like to visualize those numbers and actually have those dollar amounts. Uh, two of the, you, you say often two of the main functions of a trustee is fiscal and, and programmatical. Um, and so this is a, a fiscal decision that it does impact. Um, and um, even with the clarifying, I, I still don't feel that I have all the information that I would like to have present in front of me to make that uh, the best decision uh, that, I, that I feel I, I can make uh, currently uh, in this situation. Um, so once again, I, I, do, I do appreciate the clarifying questions um, and also the work of uh rose and, and all she's done um i just have reservations i guess um because i don't see uh the numbers or i don't see the new job uh description to really uh dive into uh, what it is i'm sure they're going to be provided uh eventually um but i just there's not here tonight so that that's all thank you guys member Vela. Uh, Oh, can you hear me okay? Um, I will just say in hiring, I'm sure that's a, I, I've seen that firsthand. It's, ex, it's expensive to go through the whole hiring process. Um, overall, I do hear what Member Rose is saying, but overall, if we're just looking at the numbers, we are cutting one salary down and no benefits. That doesn't include vaca all of the extra expenses that are going into hiring an individual in an organization such as this is a hefty amount we're collapsing that into one there is no extra there's nothing's changing other than the position the name obviously the job duties and yes a higher salary when you're taking on those duties so number wise breakdown we are saving we're this is not a negative to us this is actually a positive to us on many levels um i'll make a motion to move perfect do we have a second second all right student oh uh we have a motion and a second on the table do you want to what was that yeah she, she moved it no i did not <laughs> do i need to ask for a motion miss collins are you asking for continued discussion member morowski yeah. so complete discussion and then call for the motion after discussion okay well complete discussion go ahead member morowski um yeah i just i just wanted to say you know on balance uh, it looks to me clearly like a, a like a winner um not not only because we have an uh an amazing um public servant in in ms ramos and, and highly highly capable um public servant but it's over a thousand a hundred thousand just by looking at the um the numbers here in front of us over a hundred thousand dollars in savings at every level um in the just in the salaries um not even to mention the benefits so um from a, a, a fiscal uh, perspective it's it's certainly a certainly a winner um this is such a mission critical um position for the department, obviously, and I think we're incredibly lucky, as uh, Member Sheikh said, to um, to have uh, someone in the position who has such a strong, um, strong background and also a strong uh, dedication and commitment to our district specifically. Um, and if anyone thinks it's easy to recruit uh, top level talent like that, they are, have never <laughs> done <laughs> Ms. McCarn's job. Um, there, there are not, you know, uh, a bunch of uh, folks like Rose Ramos lining up um, to uh, to come work in our district, and um, particularly when I have to say it, when you're you're automatically as soon as you step in here, you become a, a subject of ridicule, abuse, and uh, uh, a lot of toxic. Uh, mudslinging basically that that comes at you so um this is a this is a fiscal 
savings for our district. It recognizes not a not a raise, but um, an actually different a creation of a different position with new responsibilities. And I think it's very sensible. And I'd be happy to second the motion at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Do are you put it? I'll ask for a motion now. <laughs> Go ahead. Can I would you like to move it? I would. Okay. And second? Second. Okay. All right. Student preferential vote? Aye. Superintendent Rocco? Member Pritchett? Aye. Member Morawski? Aye. Member Wu? Aye. Member Garcia? Aye. Member Villa? Aye. Member Rhodes? Uh, no. And only because I don't feel like I have all the information needed. Member Phillips? No. All right. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. McCarran, and thank, thank you. you, Ms. Ramos, for all your hard work. Um, item 11.0, public hearing 11.1, adopting, adoption, <laughs> I can't even <laughs> speak right now, <laughs> adopt revision of board policy 5113, absences and excuses. Ms. Flores, a student member shake. Good evening. Um, I'm going to start us off really quickly. These are slides that the board has already seen, I think, at last meeting. Um, so essentially, this is a process that started way back in October 15th when I was at a meeting with the California Student Board Member Association and the topic of excused absences for mental health in the context of Ed Code 480-205 came up. I emailed the superintendent almost immediately and we got the ball rolling into Ms. Flores and I have been working on this since then. And so I'm very, very excited that we're finally taking action on changing our board uh, policy to include language that um, understands this. Um, and what we understand is that the 2008 federal mental health parity uh, next slide, please. The 2008 Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act recognizes what we all should know to be true, which is that treatment of mental health and substance use disorders are on equal footing or parity with physical health care. Um, and so essentially, this is just making good on our uh, words in that resolution back in December that we as a board and as a district understand that when ed code 48205 talks about um, health reasons for mental health we're including excuse emphasis uh in that and so i'll pass it on to Ms. flores to talk about some of the benefits of what we're doing it really well said and how appropriate that we're uh, bringing this tonight when we recognized May as Mental Health Month. So student board member Shake really said it well. This is really just about expanding health reasons to reduce stigma and, and really recognize physical and mental health as being equally important and so interconnected. There haven't been any previous updates to this board policy since 2002. So we, you know, we also took a look at a, a few other bits of language and really that's about it. Uh, we can take any questions if you have any. Great. I believe we have one live comment. We have one live comment, but it's combined time for Angie Sutherland and Renee Webster Hawkins. Oh, okay. So we have two live comments then. So four minutes. It won't take that long. Um, I'm speaking uh, for thanks, both, Angie. <laughs> both Renee and myself um, on behalf of the Coalition for Students with Disabilities. And we first, we want to acknowledge the importance of these policy revisions. Uh, the new language removes stigma as it provides the definition of health reasons in the context text of excused absences to include physical and or mental health reasons. Attendance is difficult for many students to maintain, including students with disabilities and their parents having to justify absences and be met at times with a lack of understanding or punitive measures is not helpful. We hope that this revised policy results in increased understanding and acceptance. And lastly, if there is a committee that is providing input into this policy, it would be great to get more information on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I love that picture of you and Zoe. Very cute. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. I will open it up for board member Garcia. <laughs> I did, I just, um, one, I just want to say thank you for bringing this forward. Um, it's long overdue, clearly, um, but not only in terms of dates, the last 
uh, time this was uh, discussed, I think, was in 2002, but it's also timely because of what, um, you know, we've experienced this last year. But I'm wondering, does this um, change? Um, how, how does this impact our ADA? in terms of recognizing yeah. mental health as an excuse absence. So um, does that have any impact in terms of? Member Garcia, I, I, let me let me see if Ms. Ramos might be available still or if Ms. Flores might have that information. Otherwise, we can get that to you. I, I'm not aware of any, any impact. I'm not aware of any. I'm just wondering if there is um, because none comes to mind, but I'm not sure yeah. if I... I'm yeah, thinking about this means, correctly. Wait, I think member, yeah. I think Ms. I'm sorry, I'm here, Superintendent. Not, I'm not aware of any either. I could certainly, you know, look something up and get back to you. Yeah. Um, member Garcia, if I could just step in. The discussion had definitely come up back in October when I talked to the superintendent about this. Um, and essentially, there's no projections on this. Uh, this has been taken in other districts and there hasn't seemed to be any change. Um, but the idea is that students are missing school regardless for these reasons and this is just legitimizing it and bringing it out into the open so that we can destigmatize these issues that students are facing um and so I, I i i don't know if that answers your question no it does i i'm not aware that it would impact ada but i just wasn't sure so um so it was just seeking to um understand but um but thank you for bringing this forward any member roads yeah, I, I think this is uh, amazing and I'm excited about pushing it forward. I also uh, think that at a, at a different time, we should also talk about uh, this same type of uh, verbiage for uh, our staff and even our board members here, uh, because we all deal with different things in our lives um, that impact uh, how we show up and we have to be able to be able to, to be okay with being able to take time for uh, our mental health and our staff mental health as well. Yeah. Thank you. Well said. All right. With that, can we get a motion? Thank you. I had a motion and a second. Student preferential vote. Aye. Superintendent Roca. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morowski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips. Aye. All right, item 11, um, you know, it is 1126 and we still have 10 minutes. Can we extend this meeting till 1145? Moved. Thank you. Thank you. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, thank you. I want to make sure we have enough time. Okay, uh, item 11.2, adopt and adopt. <laughs> I keep on saying that wrong. Adopt revision of board policy 5141.52, suicide prevention. Hi, Ms. Flores. <laughs> me again. You get me three times. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to keep it short. So thank you so much for, um, this is our second reading of the revision to our suicide prevention board policy. Next slide, please. And you know, we've shared this before, suicide is the second leading cause of death for our young people. It's a really concerning epidemic uh, that's happening. Knowing the warning signs is incredibly impactful and that really takes the whole community to know the warning signs, every single one of us, including our, our children and our students. It requires this comprehensive public health approach and that's really what our policy uh, attempts to outline. Next slide, please. We know we've got some mandates and education code, and that's what this policy also encompasses as all of those legal mandates. Um, our, our first uh, version was adopted in 2008. And so this is just really cleaning it up and making sure that we are um, meeting some of those small tweaks that were made to the law. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the policy is intended to safeguard our students and our, our staff, um, uh, being able to recognize those signs and know what to do to get help. Um, it, it also complies with the language in Education Code 215 that now includes, and thank you, Board Member Garcia, for calling out TK through 12th grade. So we made that revision as well as uh, the small edit. Um, and next slide, uh, that, that's pretty much it. You can take any questions or answers that anyone has. Thank you. I believe we have two live comments. Renee Webster Hopkins. Hopkins. 
I'm combining time with Angie Sutherland. Okay. Are you speaking or is Angie speaking? I'm sorry, she is. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> Angie on, thank you, Renee. Hello. Hello. Um, hi, I'm speaking on behalf of Coalition for Students with Disabilities and um, want to also acknowledge the importance of making this policy compliant with Ed Code in an effort to keep students safe, prevent self-harm, deaths, and trauma. We're appreciative of the removal of law enforcement from page five of the handout, which is page two of the policy on the list of professionals schools would consult with. We also acknowledge the added clarity around the role of the district staff in suicide prevention, but actions do speak louder than words. A policy without thoughtful action behind it is just words on a paper in a district that has a pattern of not following their own policies or laws for that matter. We know of students personally in this district who have struggled with mental health issues, including self-harm and suicidal ideation, and were met with a response that not only did not help their situation, but made things worse, resulting in more trauma. Often these issues are perpetuated by discrimination and bullying. One of the positive steps that our district has taken is the new GRACE app for students to have help at their fingertips. I was just using the calming room while I was waiting to give my comment. <laughs> um, we hope that the GRACE app will be highlighted um, more in detail at an upcoming meeting and that there will be training for students and parents how to use the app in addition to the helpful guide that was already created. Um, one of the questions I have is how will students learn about the app are they are parents supposed to tell them based on the emails that went out or um, are the schools actually sharing it and um, some some students will need more in depth training on how to use it and how to understand what they're doing when they're um, using it when they're calling for urgent help or when they're um, that they even know it's available. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Forrest, actually, can you answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so we did push it out in social media, principals bulletin, you know, and, and all of the, the sort of ways that we can. But honestly, one of the things we saw with the virtual calming room was sort of the grassroots effort. And when we got uh, teachers to post it in their Google Classroom, that was the most successful um, way. And then it, it, it did sort of catch on. So we are pushing hard and for our counselors um, to, to do it and also download it um, themselves. Angie, that's a really great suggestion um, that we do some training. We've done a, a short video um, just showing um, students or staff how to walk through. I think some people think, oh, it's an app until you get into it and you play with it. So I, I love to hear that you were, you were playing with it, Angie, uh, and you can talk to Grace. Um, so those are some ideas and we welcome any others as well. Great, thank you. Do we have any other board discussion? Oh, go ahead. Um, I, I, I was just going to say that's a great idea. I feel like a lot of the times when you're training anything, but having maybe students gathering together, talking about the importance of the app, um, some kind of recorded tutorial to share um, would be wonderful. Thank you. All right. Can I get a motion for? Moved. Thank you. I got a motion and a second. Student preferential vote. Aye. Fantastic. Superintendent roll call. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morowski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Consent agenda. Uh, we have one. Oh, I'm sorry. I crossed it out. I think I was trying. To <laughs> 
<laughs> it's my fault. Sorry about that. 11.3, first reading of a revised board policy, 5146, married, pregnant, parenting students. Hi, Miss Flores. <laughs> Hi again. Sorry, I'm not Raul Bozio. I'm actually here in his place tonight. I forgot to fix that slide. We're doing the first reading of revising our board policy, 5146, um, for married, pregnant, and parenting students. And so education code does provide for protections for our students that says, you know, we, we cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. It requires the district to notify pregnant and parenting students of their rights in our annual notice as well as welcoming notices and really any time. Um, it also education code provides eight weeks of parental leave without any kind of impact. Um, it has to be an excused absence and the current version of this uh, policy um, was adopted in 98 and last revised it looks like in 2015. Um, so next slide please. Um, the, the policy really recognizes the responsibilities of, of being married or pregnant or parenting combined with those responsibilities of finishing school, right, and academically, you know, doing well while protecting the health of, of the parent and the child. Um, these revisions now comply with language in Ed Code that recognizes all the rights of pregnant and parenting students, including their right to that parental eight weeks of leave. They don't have to take it, but we have to make it available to them. Um, so it's that balance. Uh, next, uh, is, that, is that it? Yep, and that was it. Uh, so I can take any questions uh, that anyone has on this first reading. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have one live public comment for this one. It's Angie Sutherland combining her comment with Renee Webster Hawkins. Hi again. Hi, Angie. <laughs> um, so um, we agree that this is very important to have an updated policy that informs students of their rights um, and that um, it includes that they can have the eight eight weeks leave and um, and that they're entitled to accommodations. We're also requesting that some of the strike through language be kept in the policy concerning discrimination. There's um, two places where um, the discrimination is is uh, strike through. Um, on page six uh, of this handout, it's the first page of the policy. The words discriminate against are crossed out. We'd like those left in because um, students are going to need to know that if they are treated differently because of this status, that it's discrimination and they need to be able to complain about it. Um, on page seven of the handout, which is the second page of the policy, the words discrimination on the basis of pregnancy or marital or parent parental status have been removed. Um, and that's where it used to explain to students um, of their rights to file discrimination complaint. So we respectfully request that these words be added back as without this language, the policy does not describe the rights of students to be free from discrimination based on their status and the options available to them under the law. On page, last, lastly, on page six, which is the third paragraph of the policy, a statement has been removed that requires the superintendent or designee to periodically report to the board regarding the effectiveness of district strategies to support married, pregnant, and parenting students. Um, and includes may include data on participation rates in the district programs and services, academic achievement, school attendance, graduation rate, and or student feedback on district programs and services. Removal of this statement leaves no accountability or oversight for implementation of this policy, and therefore, we humbly request that this language remain intact. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Ms. Flores, do you know why that the um, discrimination piece was stroke, um, had a strike through? You know, my understanding is this was adopting the CSBA revised language. So I think it's a difference in, in wording and, and, you know, words used, but there's nothing to say we couldn't look to putting some of that back. And I can. Okay. Look yeah. If you could look nice. back into that. Yeah. Yeah, I also um, am seeing just uh, under under complaints that there is, uh, of course, the opportunity for 
uh, our students to uh, file a complaint around discrimination. So, but okay, we can circle you, back on that. Um, all right, this is the first reading, so we have time to review it and um, to make sure everything's covered. And thank you, Ms. Flores, for bringing this as um, somebody that was a teen mom and had to leave school um, and go back later. Um, it's important. I know the importance of um, being able to protect our students um, during these trying times. So thank you. We look forward to having this back. Uh, item, make sure I'm reading the right one this time. I have 12.0 consent agenda. We have a live comment on consent agenda. I don't know which item number though. Do we, do we still have a live comment on 12.0? Okay. We, we do not have any live comments. We do not have a live comment. Okay, perfect. Then can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved. All right, student preferential vote. Yes on all open session items. Thank you. And uh, superintendent roll call. Member Pritchett. Oh wait, hold, hold on superintendent. I think it was Terrence Gladney that had the live public comment. You have him on online. Thank you, board member Pritchett. I, um, and, and again, I, that's Karen. just a, <laughs> hey, that's just that's just a procedural thing. Like when you don't spell out each of the individual agenda items, then there leaves a lot of ambiguity for you know what is my intent. So for ten point four, I literally had to put in other ten point four, even though it's clearly listed on the agenda. Um, I typically don't look at the personnel transactions, but God put on my heart to do so because typically around this time we have announcements of retirement. So I want to see if any of my uh, children or, or students you know previous teachers were possibly leaving us um and to my surprise i saw tark mcfall's name um tark mcfall former principal at albert einstein um carrie rose former director of parent teacher home visit uh project roomed us together as two young african-american males he as an educator me as a parent advocate at our first uh, national conference um we instantly became brothers um you know couldn't be more different I, I grew up in berkeley he grew up in wairica um but we share a common passion for serving people especially children and families um so of course to my surprise i saw that he was listed as separation retiring so i gave him a call this afternoon and he essentially said and i'm not going to speak directly for him but but more or less he said that you know there's too many mixed messages being pushed down to our site administrators and they're being put in the middle between teachers, families, and the work that they want to do because of a directive that is centralized at the top and being forced down. I've seen it with other administrators, but they're not in a capacity to probably speak on it because they're currently employed by our district. I've seen it firsthand and, you know, it's, it's just very insensitive to focus on compensating you know, people at the top when teachers have been asked time and time again to, hey, let's implement uh, collapsed cohorts in two days. Let's go ahead and take our students back in person in two days. Hey, let's open up in person without proper technology. I mean, there's too many inconsistencies in our actions. What do we truly value? You know, Tark is not only a servant, he's a, he, he started in the classroom. There was essentially a bidding war between Oak Ridge and Firm Bacon for his services. And he became a vice principal at Firm Bacon and he was serving the, the families at Einstein. And it's unfortunate because we lost not only an African-American leader, but just a leader in general and someone who truly cares about our children and our families. But if we don't create a climate and a culture that is going to retain them and empower them to lead, then we will continue to lose more. We already know that there's a dearth of those great teachers because they become administrators and then we lose them to central office. And I spoke about this in the last meeting, but if we can't retain them in either capacity, then we're doing our children a true disservice. And this is, you know, something that we spoke Karen, about. Karen, sorry, was this on item 12.1A? Uh, it, was, it was on the personnel transaction. 
personnel change. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I asked Tark if he had an exit interview, he wasn't, he, he was asked to give an exit interview on his last day here. Which is not enough time. He was already in his new job when he was asked. So, you know, we, we can clean up a lot of processes and we can really set our priorities straight to align better with our actions or, or align our actions with what our state of priorities are. You're talking about Tarek Tar 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 Fall. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I understand. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. You as well. All right. Um, Superintendent Roll Call. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Murawski? Aye. Member Wu? Aye. Member Garcia? Aye. Member Villa? Aye. Member Rhodes? Aye. Member Phillips? All right. 13.0 Business and Financial Information Reports Received. We have no public comment on that. Future board meetings, uh, June 10th, 2021 and June 24th, 2021. Uh, I believe that we will also be putting out notification for um next thursday so all right with that i will entertain a motion for adjournment <laughs> second all right all in favor say aye all right good night